Athos is a godless world, ruled by the very same sorcerer kings that destroyed the environment thousands of years ago. Magic is a curse, and wizards are known as defilers and are feared by the people because their power drains the life from plants and creatures. And that's how the world came to be as it is today. Psionics, the will and the way, the supernatural powers of the mind are commonplace in men and beasts in Athos. For some, the will is stronger, but all are touched by its power. And the sand-blasted wilderness of the Tablelands is a lawless place where alien beasts roam the wasteland, where great storms can wipe out an entire village in mere moments, where a single drop of water is more precious than gold. Our campaign begins in the city-state of Balak. They call it the City of Sales, the Gem of the South, the greatest haven for culture and trade in a dying world. Balak is the only so-called democracy in Athos, ruled for hundreds of years by Caesar Andropinus, one of the great sorcerer kings. Caesar claims to have been elected to his position and Balak's law dictates that the position of Caesar is held for life. Templars, known as Praetors, are elected to 10-year terms. They serve Caesar as his enforcers and oversee his public works. Patricians are the noble class of Balak, often serving as leaders in one of its great merchant houses. A council of high patricians, powerful Blind psionics are elected to lifelong terms and are charged with writing and reforming the laws of the city. But despite its democracy and the wealth of its merchant class, despite its acceptance of all people, Balak is not a kind or a fair place. There are the rich and the powerful, and then there's everyone else struggling every day to buy food and water for their families, trying to avoid the corrupt gaze of guards and officials. The great gates of the city are manned by a small army of soldiers wielding wooden shields, simple spears, and daggers made from bone, charged to keep out criminals and to keep the denizens of Balak who were taught that stepping outside the walls can mean certain death inside the city. And always, always there are two half-giants guarding on either side of that great gate, towering, wielding massive clubs crafted from black obsidian. And so our tale today that begins not far from the city gates, in the Criterion, the epicenter of culture in Balak, its great gladiatorial arena. The stony rise of stands in the Criterion are packed with a deafening audience cheering and jeering for the fight below. In the center of the sandy arena, a skinny male human gladiator wielding a wooden staff and a female halfling gladiator with long hair dreaded with finger bones circle around their foe. A furless brown beast about the size of a boar covered with loose folds of scaly hide. The beast, uh, known as a tembo, opens its maw to reveal fangs as long as knives and a forked tongue that droops, hanging down to the ground. It charges, grunting and snorting, barreling directly towards the male gladiator. He dives out of the way, just barely, rolling quickly to his feet. In that moment, the halfling gladiator slides a leather gauntlet in fitted with obsidian claws over her hand and she leaps wildly for the creature. Before she can strike, however, a distorting wave of energy begins to reverberate. It ripples away from the beast, silencing the crowd for a moment. They watch down as the halfling and human cry out in agony, press their hands to their foreheads. And a moment later, they both fall unconscious to the ground. The crowd is not happy about that. And they boo and they howl, disappointed at how quickly the fight is over. 
the beast's animal trainer, a one-eyed half-giant who watched the fight from the edge of the arena, grumbles, grunts, and marches over towards the beast, and the tembo circles the defeated gladiator, snorting, licking its flat snout with its forked tongue. The animal trainer beams brightly, raises his fists in victory, beats his chest, and then looks up to the grand spectator box, focusing his gaze on the praetor of the arena precinct, the highest elected official present at the games today, the one who must now decide whether these gladiators' lives will be spared or if they will become food for the hungry Tembo. The trainer's eyes rise to meet Praetor Rysars. Hello and welcome, Toby. Please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you're playing today, and what they look like as we see them for the first time up in the stands of the Criterion. Hello, Don. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name's Toby Osmond. Uh, I'm an actor and a role player. I am playing Rysar Rathamir, an elven a praetor. Uh, I have, uh, there is uh, artwork, uh, black hair, tan skin. My character comes from the desert tribes of the elves. Uh, but has made his way in the political world of Balak the last 10 or so years. Uh, he is coming up for re-election. And he presently resides in the gladiatorial district, like he said. And I'm excited to start. So, um, Don, can I address the, uh, the, the NPCs, the, the gladiator in the arena? Absolutely. So at this point, as you're looking down with the beast roaming about them, they're just coming to consciousness, but they're still weak. They're on their knees, barely cognizant. And uh, sitting next to you in the box is the half-giant Gulag, one of the city gate guards. He's dressed in fine but poorly fitting purple silks. And he kind of looks aside to you, waiting to see how you're going to react to the situation. Who owns the gladiators? or employs the gladiators so uh the gladiators are employed by house jerko who employs most of the gladiators in the city and even the beast trainer here that half giant with one eye who profits the most if his beast is victorious works for house jerko hmm. so no matter what in a way house jerko wins this fight uh, I would like to turn and address the audience closest to the uh, royal box and ask them, I say, friends, Balikians, countrymen, what is your opinion? Should the beast eat or should the gladiators have a chance? All those in favor of the beast feasting, say I. And I would like to gauge the response. Absolutely. So go ahead and we'll do our first role for the campaign will be an insight check. Hmm, okay. And as you call out, um, it takes a moment for the crowd to fully hear you. And some people in the crowd are hushing up the people next to them. And almost immediately, when you ask, should the beast feast, half of the crowd roars, clapping, stomping their feet, bouncing up and down in the stands. But the other half of the crowd is silent. What 13. was... 13. <laughs> 13. Lucky for some. Solid 13. <laughs> so uh, with a 13, um, you notice that uh, just glancing around briefly, the half of the crowd who is most hungry for bloodshed um, tend to be the wealthier people in the crowd. Mm. People who are dressed nicely, comparatively. Uh, can I also check? I would imagine it would be the poorer members of the audience who would reside in my district. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So as you're looking around and you're looking for um, familiar faces or at least, uh, you know, the the more normal class citizen who makes up the vast majority, you know, 95 percent of the population of Valley, hmm. um, some of them are watching, interested or anticipating or anxious. Uh, some of them are actively turning away, though, trying to have conversations, trying to not look down at what's happening on the pit floor below. Um, I would like to address the uh, the Beastmaster, the half giant in the pit, <clears throat> and I say, "Give these gladiatorial heroes a chance against your beast. Hold it for a few moments and give them one more chance." You can see that there's a hesitation uh, in the. Uh, eyes and uh, just the tension in his shoulders of the half giant, but you are the praetor, and he is just a beast trainer. Okay, I'd like to turn to the audience and say, fellow countrymen, everyone here in this city of high democracy and high culture deserves a chance. But only one. Beastmaster. Allow your beast to attack. At this but point, I want to give I want to give the uh, the the two gladiators a time to get up to recover. Yeah, um, yeah. So at this point, they've sort of scrambled up to their feet. Uh, the halfling has refitted her right hand with that gauntlet, um, and the skinny human who you, you can tell now. Uh, his face is haggard. He doesn't look like he's eaten in a long time. He doesn't look like a gladiator. He gathers up his uh, staff and they sort of shoulder off so that their shoulders are almost touching. They're facing in different directions. They don't look as eager to fight the beast now as they did before. Huh. And the beast trainer kneels down to the ground and puts a hand, a great hand, larger than the head of the tembo, down to pet and scratch at its scales and folds of flesh, and it continues to lick its snout as it waits. And then the beast master grunts, stands up, and lets go of the beast. Is Ricer just watching with interest at this point? I shout to the, to the uh, contestants, whoever comes out of this will be rewarded by myself personally. And you can see the beast bundle forward on all four of its legs, lowering its head and snapping with its jaws, its fangs. Uh, both gladiators leap out of the way at the same time and they begin to circle around, trying to keep ahead of the creature's charges, trying to tire it out, which is an age-old tactic in gladiator fights. And as the fight continues on, Gulag, the half giant next to you in those fine purple silks, leans over and he kind of gives you a nudge with his elbow. Then he chomps down onto the fried leg of some large, very large animal. You can see that the grease is spilling down the side of his cheek, staining his nice silk robes. And he grunts and says, mm, You better not mess this up. It's not a threat, is it, dear boy? Oh, of course not. The city needs you. <laughs> or at least I need you. You're up for re-election. Can't be making unpopular decisions, Rysar. No. Right. Well, that's why I gave the decision to the people. It seems they're quite split, then. It's the trouble with mm -hmm. the people. They often don't really know what they want themselves. They're not allowed to. That's why. He bites again that fried leg and he waves it down at the ring below. And you can see now that the male human, the skinny male human, has just thrust the staff, the base of the quarter staff, right into the face of the tembo. The wood snaps and splinters off, barely stunning the beast for half a moment before it continues barreling forward. And it takes his legs out from underneath him. He flips over the creature's head and lands on the ground. And you watch as the creature begins to turn back around. It's tongue trailing across the ground. Uh, the way I see it, old chap, is 
I win the popular support of the people if the humanoids win, or I win the backing of the well-to-dos if the humanoids become lunch. So it's really a win-win situation, don't you think? Mm. Anything can be spun the wrong way. Letting those (laughs) gladiators live looks weak. Well, let's see what happens. Care to place a small wager? Oh, I already spent most of my betting money this month. Oh, don't you? But all right. Oh. No, no, no. I always, uh, wait, who are, who you have? Uh, I think the, I tell you what, I, I think the beast will kill the human and I think the halfling will overcome it. But I mean, that's not really a fair split, is it? What do you think? Mm. I think the Timbo takes them both. Hmm. Very well. I say the, I say the humanoids will have it. It's right as you say that that uh, <laughs> you can hear the screams of the man down below. Only lasts a second, and then it's over. The Timbo doesn't play with its food. It turns back around, and the halfling is ducked down low to the ground. Has the gauntlet out, ready to defend herself. Um, she's staying very low to the ground and she's basically untied and retied her hair up on top of her head so it doesn't get caught in the gauntlet. She's Mm -hmm. waiting on the very far side of the pit, so for the beast to charge her, it would be a long charge indeed. Okay. I watch on. You watch uh, the beast charge. It gets halfway across the gladiator pit, and the halfling doesn't move. Her eyes are steady. You can see that there's a little bit of fear in them, but she doesn't shake or shift. And then, Rysar, you hear uh, you hear a scream from somewhere behind you. It's actually in the hall that you use to access this box. Sounds like a male cry. Okay. I'm concerned about that. I turn around. You can see somebody staggering, um, a shape, a silhouette in the darkness, in the hall behind. They're crying out again, choking. Does the half giant next to me have a weapon? Um, yeah, he always keeps a club smaller than the one that he would use if he was on duty, but still pretty big, pretty heavy. Kalag's his name? Uh, Gulag. Gulag. Gulag to arms. Uh, there's a commotion behind us. Mm. He stands up and pushes his chair over. It actually falls to the ground. He throws his, um, he throws his half-eaten animal leg out into the pit beyond grabs his club and stares through that hallway and do you I'm, see I'm definitely sort of edging behind him <laughs> <laughs> and he, he's a he's a big fella so and you can you can kind of get behind him there uh, and you see a man dressed in fine gold and white robes um, looks like a member of the wealthy class rotund balding stumbling out of the tunnel he's holding the side of his face and you can hear as he kind of stumbles into your view and cry out praetor praetor a thief a wizard that burned my face with magic robbed me a wizard you say when where just now just outside in the tunnel he points back, still holding his face. You can see through his fingers that there are like sizable burns. A part of his face is black from whatever's happened to him. Are there any other guards or anything like that in the royal box? Uh, in this box, it's just you and the half giant. Okay. And there are other guards around, but it's a large criterion. And, you know, there's 
many, many exits and entrances. Think like a major stadium, you know, mm. for a modern day sports. And it's very similar. Okay. Um, Toby, if you, if you don't mind too, if you can pop up your volume or slide your mic just a little bit closer. Yeah, to yeah, absolutely. How's that? <clears throat> yeah, I think that's better. Cool. So, so in this moment, you see this figure, burnt face, staggering towards you. You mm. see uh, Gulag lift to his feet and reach for his club warily. He's letting you stay behind him because he knows his place. And the patrician is pointing back towards the tunnel, which is the entrance and exit for whoever's well-to-do. This is the nicest of the boxes in the stadium. Okay. Um I address the uh, my friend in the box. Gulag, there is. Uh, uh, we must go down the corridor. <laughs> what about our bet? Um, what's happening in the arena? Uh, as you glance over your shoulder, it's actually really interesting. The beast has part of like has several wounds on its neck, and is chasing around in circles the halfling you see the halfling jump up and kick off the wall jump and roll over the beast slice it several times it, she's putting up a good fight excellent well listen gulag we'll see the results one way or another let's go and find this wizard shall we uh, all right i go i sort of try and shuffle him down the corridor in front of me He's he's big and he takes long steps, but he is slow. Oh, I, a... okay, it's politics. I'll go first. I'm going to be a hero, but <laughs> let me know if I see anything scary. Absolutely. <laughs> and go ahead and roll me a perception check, Toby. Okay. <laughs> Five. <laughs> So this tunnel stretches on straight and then bends to the right. You can see the light of an exit spilling. It's daylight. It's a hot, sunny day right now. You can see the daylight spilling around the corner of that bend. You don't see anybody in the tunnel. No. Is anyone there? Hello? Show yourselves. You uh -huh. hear, though you don't see, the pattering, quick, light foot. Okay. It's down the hall uh, to the right. I mean, I, I, okay, I go that way. Um, is this towards the uh, other wealthy boxes, or is it towards an exit? Or this would take you down a flight of stairs, um, a long flight of stone stairs, to the north side of the Criterion. So it would empty out into what's called the maze, and the maze is an area of the Harbor District uh, that is basically shanty town slums. A lot of people live there. It's very crowded and it's very easy to get lost in the back twist of streets. Okay. I want, if I think I heard footsteps that way, then I'll, I'll go that way. But I'm being quite wary because if no one's actually watching me, then I don't need to be a hero. Uh, Gulag, you can hear his footsteps lumbering behind you, but you're gonna lose him pretty quickly if you're running. I, I am going. I am gonna run, but I'm gonna jog. I'm not sprinting. Okay. I'd say this I'm is a, my full normal distance. You're not building up dash. into your like elvish dash that you can do. Absolutely not. No. Okay. As you turn the corner and get to the top of the steps, you can see down over the edge of the city. You can see the sprawl of run down buildings, lots of bodies pushing through what's a sort of edge of the marketplace. Um, you can see beyond the docks where the silt skimmers sail in and out of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see some smoke rising from the shipyard. And roll me a perception check. Eleven. You see two figures uh, down at the base of the stairs, both moving towards a throng of people um, towards the Harbor District. One of them is a man uh, wearing the typical wear of a garb, a garb of a, of a guard, 
rather. So simple armor, a uh, simple wooden spear tipped with bone, uh, and a wooden shield. You also see moving faster, running, um, small, maybe a boy or a young man, uh, blonde hair, human, uh, wearing urchin's clothes, dirty, grimy, running at the base of the stairs out into the harbor and that throng of people beyond. Okay. Um, and the giant isn't directly behind me. He's a bit further back. Or... You can hear that he's just, he, he's grunting with like every step and cursing underneath his breath because uh, he wore his nice robes today. Um, this is not what he asked for, but uh, he, you can hear him. He's just turned the corner um, and he's coming to where you are now. Okay. And is there a... Um... Is there a spot that the giant can't see? Uh, so is it a straight corridor from the giant to outside? Right, yeah. If you if you took a step to your right, you would be yeah. out of the doorway. Okay. Um, I want to try and sort of sneak through the step, uh, do a little side step and then pursue and actually start running. Okay. Uh, and where are you running to? What's your what's your intention here? So there's the, um, the is the waif and the guard. Are they going two separate ways? Did you say? They're mo both moving towards the throng. The waif is moving faster, uh, and the guard is moving more casually. Okay, I want to go after the waif, and also I'm aware that they said the the attacker was in uh, white and gold. Was it? That was the the attacky. That was the mm. patrician who got his face burned. Oh, sorry. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, neither of these two look like wizards, do they? Mind you, you can never tell. Not particularly. Okay, I um, I run after the waif. All right, so you pick up to your full speed. What is your full speed when you are running um, to the best of your ability? Mm. Yeah. Roll me a, a, let's call it an acrobatics or athletics check. <laughs> I'm not the most athletic. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me just get back onto this. Okay. Ah, oh, these are such mediocre dice. Someone send me some uh, decent dice, please. <laughs> right, that was an eight on the dice, which is a. Sorry, just one. Okay, it's a fourteen, I think. Oh, here we are. The side. All right. So you sprint down the stairs, moving swiftly. Uh, you About slip once. You... <laughs> yeah, you, you'll. I'll say you slip once, but you keep your footing, and you almost glide down the stairs very gracefully. You get just to the edge of that throng of people. You blow past the guard, uh, and there's the waif there. The waif looks back over his shoulder at you, and as he sees you rushing towards him, there's a burst of fear in his face. Do you grab him? Yeah. Roll me an arcana <laughs> check. That's better. My arcana check. That is a dirty 20. Okay. When you touch the wave, yeah. He's not he's not there. He just fizzles out of existence, almost like a puff of smoke. Damn illusion. As you look beyond further looking around further into the the crowd, you get a sense that this is magic. Um and you see the waif again further away, further into the crowd. Okay. He looks over his shoulder nervously. He doesn't see you, but he looks over his shoulder nervously, and then he continues to dart through the crowd and towards the harbor district. I want to try and follow it. Okay. 
Um, it's tight here, so if you're going directly through the crowd, then I'll need another athletics check. Is there a way around? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do I? How you well notice, do I know the know, area? You know the area pretty well. Uh, I okay. think you've gone through the maze before. People that you've had to uh, look for or have a talk with often try to hide there. Um, yeah. So you can, if you want, you can roll me either an athletics check if you want to try to go directly for them, or you can roll me an insight check if you want to try to guess where they're headed and cut them off. Okay. I would like to try. Um... Sorry, it was one of those intelligence based, did you say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would I would let you give me an investigation check. The DC will be a little bit higher, but I would let that. Happen. I'll do that. Oh yeah, okay. That is a 16. So with a 16, um, you can see the street that he's starting to turn down ahead. Okay. And a, a cart crosses your path, and right after it passes beyond you, being pulled by a long lizard-like beast, you see the, uh, that the waif is gone. But you have an idea of where he must be going, enough so that you could cut back through the back streets and maybe cut him off. Okay. To do so would it. take you out of the public eye, so That's to speak. Fine. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, I do that. And uh, I'm trying to be aware of my surroundings, like see, um, you know, make sure I'm not ambushed or walking into an ambush or something like that. Sure, sure. Med, what's what's your passive perception, just out of curiosity? Oh God, I don't know. Uh, oh, that's okay. What do I, what's your perception bonus? Do, 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 do. So I'm having some issues on uh, row 20 at the moment. Well, that's okay. So as you're looking that up, I'll say you, you do your best to navigate around the city streets and you come to the point where you think that the waif must have gone. Mm. Um, you don't see him immediately. But let okay. me know what your perception is there. Is it based on wisdom or intelligence? Uh, wisdom. Oh, okay. It will be plus two, I think. So, 12, is that? Ah, here we go. Have we found it? Go. Ah. My passive perception is... Sorry, I've gone. Um, 13. Like so you see, uh, we'll, we'll say what you see is a set of footprints in the silt that's blown out of the harbor over the city streets um, that look fairly fresh. They haven't been washed over by the wind yet, uh, leading to a tower. It's an old ruined bell tower, a few stories tall. The wizard's front, tower. It's a wizard's well, tower. <laughs> it's decommissioned, maybe at one point. <laughs> um, you see it leading towards that tower. You're not sure if it is the boys or not, but it okay. looks recent. Um, I'm going to follow to the tower. And you see a door that's half fallen in, half crumbled by rock. Um, a few stories above it is an open pair of windows where the bell tower would sit and ring back when it actually worked. Okay. Um, I want to, because I'm used to uh, hunting wizards, um, I want to, before I go in, I just want to check around the door, make sure there's no arcane runes or spells, I think. Or... Like a trap, yeah. Do you have a, yeah. like a detect magic or any, any sort of spell that would be appropriate here? Um, the, uh, let me see. I mean, I have my arcane knowledge. Like, Let's try that then. Know. We'll say, give me an arcana check. Cool. Uh -huh. Come on. Oh, what's that? 
Oh, that's not bad. 12 on the dice, which is... 18. There is magic here, um, higher up. It's not a okay. trap. It's, some, it's something else. It's something strange. Okay, I want I want to go up, but I also want to be aware of physical traps. I'm sort of I don't want to trip do a trip wire or get clunked on the back of the head by a guard or something. So I I carefully yeah. ascend. You climb through that sort of opening of crumbled wood and stone, and there's a bell tower with spiraling stairs up above. Um, you have to tread carefully. Yes. And looking around, it doesn't look like there's any visible traps, but just these stairs are so crumbly that you step lightly to make sure that you get to the top. Okay. Uh, is there anything you want to do before you ascend to the very top of the tower? I mean, what's at the top of the tower? Is it just stairs going up? And is there a trap door? Is it a separate room or can yep. I Imagine it's one of those, you know, one of those doors that you would push up. Okay, right. It's so heavy it's wind doors. <sighs> okay, well, hey, let, now I think I'm probably just going to go for it and open the door. <laughs> it takes a lot of strength uh, to push it open. It's old and it resists, and it's actually a little bit stuck and rusted. Uh, suggesting maybe that someone has it's too heavy that's right hmm. but as you push it open with a creak the bell tower at the top of the ruin is quite a surprise the wind from the sea of silt whips through the tower's two open windows causing the broken well to sort of uh, sway back and forth it doesn't ring because it doesn't have the pieces necessary to ring but it still sways and at the top of the tower is a tiny paradise of grass growing out of stone, of colorful flowers blooming out of the walls and ceiling. The light from the crimson sun outside seems sort of diffused here, just a little less hot and less severe than in the city beyond. It shouldn't be possible, but the top of the bell tower is almost like a small garden. And in the corner of the room, the young urchin has his back pressed up against the wall. He breathes exhaustedly and stretches one hand out before him. He doesn't see you, but he sees that rise of the trap door. Mm. You can see a flash of fear cross his expression as he sees your approach, or at least something approach. Mm. Please, I didn't want to hurt him. It was going to make me fight. Going to make me fight in the arena. I I just wanted him to leave me alone. I didn't mean no harm. What's your name? That seems to startle him even more as he's looking around himself. Ah, uh, I'm, I'm Van. They call me Van. I'm, I'm nobody. Van, you appear to be a spellcaster. That, I don't hurt nothing. I try not to. And I, I can't help it. I was taught when I was young, I didn't know it was wrong. Van, I want you to come with me. As you can tell, uh, as you can see or not see perhaps, we may have more in common than you might have thought. But I wish to have conversations with you. Would that be okay? Sort of pulls his long hair back out of his face. Um, he's looking straight in your direction now, and he says, Praetors, I took my pa when I was younger, said they wanted to help him, and I never saw him again. That is a tragedy for you. I do wish to speak to you, however. I believe there is a half-giant on his way here. Will you come with me, and will you come with me quickly? I... And swallows and tries to put on a bit of a brave face. 
stands up, lowers his hand just a little. You can see his other hand, his left hand, move back and touch a blooming flower with this sort of sweet smell spills off of it just behind him. Okay. <clears throat> um, relax. Come downstairs. Here, I'll open the trap door further for you. Come with me. He swallows hard and he says, What choice I got? I There's didn't justice. Put it like that. <laughs> but please. Trust me. There's just, as he stares now directly into your eyes, a hint of a smile on his face. He's still touching that flower behind him. But we're going to cut away from this scene right here. And we are going to go elsewhere. We move now to the villa district of Malik. This is where the great manors of the city's nobles live, the home to its leaders, and the merchant houses. There are vast estates of plentiful farms kept up by hired workers of the nobles, dotting the rolling hills of the district from where they overlook the majority of the city, the slums down below. One such estate is House Akatia, one of the oldest and noblest houses in the world. Its olive gardens and orchards stretch beyond the manor's yellow stone walls and vibrant purple shutters as far as the eye can see. Insects chitter amongst pale grass of the orchard, their sounds offset by a, a sort of mournful song that drifts from the manor windows nearby. A blackbird flutters down from the roof of the manor to land on an olive tree branch just above the young Merilla, the last scion to the house that has suffered a string of recent deaths, leaving it with almost no air. Sam, welcome to Dark Sun. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you'll playing, uh, be playing and, and sort of what they look like right now, how you imagine them in the orchard. Marula is a half-elf. They have short curly hair, olive skin, very much dressed in what we would recognize as an ancient Roman fashion, except for a extensive knotwork bracelet around their arm. They're slim, quite young, a little twitchy, a little nervous. But they're very happy to see their bird. And the bird sort of pecks a little bit just at the branch, taking small olive off of it. You can hear sounds of talking, low voices, um, but many of them spilling out of the windows with that music. I'm supposed to speak at the funeral. Father asked me. I've been rehearsing. You can be my audience now. Uh, I'm still not any good at public speaking. The blackbird chirps a little bit and flies up, circles once around the tree, and flies basically like right in front of your face, just fluttering its wings and then back up to the branch again. I know, but practice only gets me so far. I, I wasn't meant for this. I wasn't the one that was. <sighs> I haven't been in this villa for so long. It seems so much emptier now. Except today, with everyone there. Hmm. 
Roll me um, a perception check. Mm-hmm. Thirteen. Do you kind of glance over your shoulder just briefly, nervous, thinking you're alone? You almost don't see her, but then you do. Lady Essen, there at the top of the path, not too far off, just watching you, her hands on her hips. She's observing. She takes a step forward, a little bit of a limp, but a proud limp. And she wears today a fine dress of olive embroidered by touches of gold. It's fancy, but it's not too flashy. After all, she is the house's etiquette teacher, and it would not do for her to outshine others today. Pretend like we can behave. She's watching. The bird squawks very loudly, flaps its wings, but stays on the branch. You are no help. I love you, Chloe. Stay there. I'll be back. (coughs) (laughs) Lady Essen? I'm going to go up to her. She's still moving down the path towards you. Not hurried. She stops once you start coming to her um, and lets you do the bulk of the walking so that she doesn't have to. And she sort of sighs. Now, Mahrula, I know these events can be a little bit much until you're used to them. The members and friends of House Akatsya expect you to attend your own cousin's funeral. Why? Why are you out here getting your clothes dirty? Mm, Ah, I I was rehearsing to speak. I, I need it. She sort of gives you that, I'm not sure if I believe you or not, look. And she shakes her head and licks her thumb and walks over towards you and uh, just very gently brushes your cheekbone just to take a little bit of the smudge off that you had gotten from blowing dirt particles outside. I withstand it like the adult that I certainly am. (laughs) She steps back and looks you over, uh, considering whether or not she believes you're ready. Uh, How long do you need? I'm ready. Of course you are. You have to be. And she turns and offers you an arm. Uh, I I just left one thing. I'll I'll be right in, right behind you, right I'll, behind you. I promise. I promise. I promise. I promise. I'll wait for you inside. She begins to limp back up the path towards the door that leads into the villa. Do I see anybody else? Is Not anybody outside. else watching? Uh, you can roll me a perception check. Somebody's watching. I don't know (laughs) if an eight is going to tell me. You don't see anybody. Well, I'm going to just... I am... I did make a mess. I'm going to just duck into a little bit of a blind spot in the doorway and clean myself up a little bit. The blackbird follows you almost inside the house. It actually lands on top of the open doorway and watches you as you clean yourself off a little bit. Uh, It squawks a little bit when you do, and then it flies away, circling back up to the roof of the house, disappearing from view outside. But you're clean and you're ready. You can hear the voices of those gathered inside waiting Time to go. I go very fast before I lose my nerve. 
Lady Essen meets you just uh, inside the next little doorway waiting for you. And together, you make yourself towards, uh, make your way towards the grand sunroom. So here, there are windows stained with an olive hue that diffract the harsh sunlight outside, casting the ornate room with a soft green glow. And in the center of the room, a high bed of red silks catches the light from above. On top of the bed is the body of your very distant cousin, Artemis, who must have been a dashing young human in life with fine raven hair and a chiseled jaw. You never really knew him that well. In the crowded room of so-called friends of the family, they likely never really knew him that well either. But that does not stop them from mourning profusely, openly weeping and placing painted vases down around the bed. Each vase is painted to depict a scene of Artemis's life, but the scenes are often out of disproportion, showing the young man as some sort of warrior on some stories and hero or scholar in others, when in truth, Artemis was just a wealthy olive merchant who kept to his own. And you sort of take in the scene of, from the back of the crowd and you see Lord Lucius stand upon the dais before the bed, dressed in these purple uh, and white robes, the aging head of House Acacia, looking around the crowd. So he's looking for somebody. Mm. He sees your hand just make its way up above the heads of the others. And for a moment, you can catch his eyes on your eyes. In the back of the crowd. Nobody else sees, seems to be paying you too much mind right now. It's better that way, but uh, uh, is he giving me the, the beckoning or? No, no, not just... yet. Okay, good. Then I've done my due diligence of saying hello. And I guess <laughs> now I'm expected <coughs> to <coughs> mingle. <laughs> How does Marilla mingle? Mm. Uh, I'm going to try to find house colors I recognize. Maybe something, maybe someone distant. There might be a second cousin like three or four times removed. I, I don't know how many times they've been removed, but if I can remove them one fewer closer to me, that would be ideal. <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you um, what's very obvious about this group of people is how few members of House Acacia are here. Um, House Wavir is well attended. Um, several praetors that you, if you don't know who they are, you've at least seen their faces and you recognize their garb are present. Other rich nobles from other patrician families are here. Uh, but there's just not that much left of House Akatsi, at least not um, prominent members. Mm -hmm. and as you're sort of looking around and thinking about mingling, you can feel just this looming presence over your shoulder, Lady Essen. You can imagine without even looking back how she looks down at the back of your head watching you deal with the scene. Mm -hmm. And I look around at them do any of the other houses, do they look happy about this? Roll me an insight check. 17. That's pretty good. Yeah. So there is a lot of show happening here. Yeah. Some more dignified than others. Members who are just shaking hands, offering their consolences or condolences. Uh, and there's people who are openly weeping, but none of it seems honest. Um, a couple uh, that are just enjoying the food and drink that are set out, none of them are so brash as to be a laughing and merry during this, but they certainly seem less bothered by the bed and the scene in the center of the room. 
uh, you would recognize one of those by the, the food and drink as being a dwarf, um, dwarf bald, no hair at all, uh, like all dwarves in Athos, uh, but wearing leather traveler clothes um, with a, a, a mail of cankale in his hand. Uh, you would recognize him as Rotan Var. He's a younger dwarf, and he's recently become the head of House Wavir, um, which, unlike your house, uh, elects its leaders. How progressive. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go up and, and thank him for coming. <clears throat> you approach how do you how do you thank him what is uh what is the direct method you take here uh i will walk up and wait to be acknowledged as one does in these sort of mingleish situations at which point i'll let him at least recognize my colors, if not my identity. And as you approach, um, he's speaking quietly to another dwarf who's dressed in a little more fine clothes, a little more properly, probably for a funeral. Uh, and he pats him on the shoulder and, and waves him off as he looks beyond and sees you sort of timidly or, or approach enough to wait for him to beckon you in the rest of the way. And he says, oh, mm, mm, Marilla, ain't it? Yes, I, I am. Thank you. Thank you for coming, for respecting um, my cousin. But of course, the right thing to do. Uh, Rotan Var, a friend of the family's, and he sort of brushes his pants and extends a big, uh, strong looking hand that appears to have worked outside for a large part of its life. I shake his hand very daintily. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't do the, he's actually very, you know, surprisingly um, not using too much force, also matching your pace. And he sort of folds his arms over his barrel of the chest and says, I'm so watered up. Well, were you business you acquaintances? Sorry. Oh, well, but I, yeah, of course. Um, house with beer, uh, so we trade with everybody. I'm, I'm sure, but I'm sure there's a difference between trade and and acquaintanceship, friend, friendship. I, there it is, and I won't lie to you and say that I knew Artemis well. You're a quiet fellow, nice enough, I suppose, but uh, not the sort of man I'd uh, ask out for a drink. Oh. Uh, why do you... Does that surprise you that I tell you that? Many people here, I imagine, would fall over themselves not to speak anything but exuberant praise of those who have lost, true or not. A little more honesty is refreshing. Mm. Uh, it's a tough world, and your family's had it bad recently. I do mourn for that. Bad for business, bad for friends. But Artemis, I just didn't know him, but I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you, Rotir. I appreciate it. I confess I didn't know him as well as I would have liked either distant family, more distant than I would have liked. I was hoping I might mm. 
learn just a little bit more about him, even late. Well, you know, you could always ask the Lord. He points over your shoulder and um, you can hear <laughs> Lord Lucius's <clears throat> sort of clearing his throat. I'm sure Father would be happy to tell me a great many things. Are ye all right? Have I been rude? I'm sorry. Am I, no. should I be, is there something you need? Do you need, I could go get you something to drink. Am I? I'm, fi I'm fine. I'm fine. I just want to know. Are you all right? After everything that's happened. I'm, I don't know what kind of expectations of all right there might be. Well, you know what comes next in these affairs, and... So far, all that has come next have been more deaths. Accidents. Aye. Accidents. Do his eyes go to anyone in particular? They do shift behind, beyond you. Do you turn to look? Yes. There's a lot of people moving about, mingling. Um, an interesting interaction, a handshake between two individuals who used to be friends who had a falling out a few years back. Lord Lucius himself has just stepped down from the dais and he is shaking the hand of High Praetor Kalamni. And Kalamni is this wrinkled old man. He's had office for 70 years. He's the oldest High Praetor left in the city. Um, the oldest person to have an elected position besides the Caesar. He's the high praetor of social welfare. And they're right now shaking hands and you can see Lord Lucius, who's much taller, bend down and whisper something into the wrinkled old man's ear. I look back to Rotier. He's just smiling at you. Takes another drink. I... I confess I've spent most of my time on my family's country estate. I haven't spent much time in Balak, but I will be spending more now. I've moved all of my things here, so it is lovely to meet you and meet more people in, in the city, as it were. I, I well, I'm always about and busy here and there. Uh, you come find me whenever you want. I imagine soon enough uh, we'll be working together. Yes, I suppose that's true. At this point, well, I'm next in line. And right as you say that, there's another throat clearing, um, and. It's Lord Lucius having taken the dais again, and he's waving his hands down to hush the crowd. <clears throat> he clears his throat, and he begins to speak, addressing everyone in the crowd. He says, ah, death is a part of life. We are all born from the silt and fire, and to the fire and silt we return when our time is past. I have mourned much for House Akatsia these past years. My wife, my children, my nieces and nephews, all gone now. But House Akatsia is like the silt 
itself. The fire cannot burn down our house. We are the earth. We are the sky. I mourn now for the passing of Artemis. He was my heir, and he was a fine enough young man. Let us honor him today, and tomorrow, let us look forward to the future. I would call now to speak the new scion of House Akatsia, they who will take my place when I die in leading our noble house, Marula. And with that, Lord Lucius gestures towards where you're standing with Rotan Var, and all eyes in the room turn towards you. In the crowd, you can see members of their houses and notable faces, Lady Essen, um, Kalamni is now watching you. All eyes are on you, but none of them as severe as Lord Lucius's himself. What do I roll not to faint? <laughs> A constitution check. Great. This will go well. Oh, I don't faint, I don't faint. Natural 20, I don't faint, I don't faint, I don't faint. I'm good, I'm good. I've got this. Uh, this is the most clutch. <laughs> First nat 20 of the campaign. Thank you, Father. And thank you all who are assembled to remember my cousin Artemis and to commemorate his deeds and those of House Akatius. As my esteemed father and Lord of our house says, though our circumstances have been grave, our house is resilient. I will, with my father's wise guidance, lead the House Akaki Akachius into a brave new future, but always with a remembrance of those who have laid that foundation, such as my cousin. Artemis will be remembered and his legacy will always be that of the legacy of House Akachius. Thank you so much. There's uh, a spattering of um, awkward applause, right? It's a slow clap from a couple of individuals that quickly ends because it's not appropriate. There's the severe look from Lord Lucius himself. You can see his disapproval and just the slight head shake. Beside you, Rotan Var sort of hesitates and then attempts to pat your shoulder. He says, uh, I thought you did well. Not fair to ask you to do that. I, I'm not going to stick around for uh, what comes next, but I, are you planning on going to uh, that political gala on the Grand Garden in a few days? It, ha it, it has been put on my agenda, yes. Oh, well. Will I see you there? I hope so. Make sure you see hi. Always nice to see a friendly face. Hi. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing you again, Erla. Thank you. At this point, um, four moles and moles are, they're half humans, half dwarves. Um, bald like dwarves but large and broad like humans very strong and these are four workers for house acacia and they come at lord lucius's beck and to grab the poles of this bed and lift the body in the bed up from the center of room and lord lucius steps aside and everyone creates a path through the middle of the room as these four workers lead 
the body of Artemis out towards the wide villa door. You know that uh, the next steps are to inter the body, um, that there's not much of a ritual, just, uh, just enough that it always goes the same way. And everyone else will follow or they will leave here. And already Rotan Bar kind of uh, smiles at you as they start the procession and excuses himself with a bow and starts to shrink back towards the other exit. And I move forward and fall in behind my father and the pallbearers. You fall in line uh, towards the front of the line um, and Lord Lucius is a very tall man, older, but still very physically adept, uh, well-kept, well-aged. And as you step together, he doesn't want to make too much of a point of it because it would be unseemly, but you know him well enough that when he just glances at you out of the corner of his eyes, that's a meaningful glance. Oh, that one was not a good glance. What, I, I'm curious, um, what does Marilla think of their, uh, of their speech of this moment of what what do they in so let me ask you how do they feel about everything that just happened in a general sense and then i have a second question for you graded on a curve of how much experience they have i think they did very well all things considered in any kind of objective sense really not well at all and where do you, is there anywhere right now as they're starting this procession walk, they wish they could be other than here? Is there a specific place that come, that pops into their mind? Certainly, literally anywhere else, but foremost, I do like being in the orchards. It's around, living things. I, I like that. And as you follow the procession beside Lucius, you hear the squawk of your blackbird. You can see it fly overhead in a long, lazy circle, the hot sky. And you think that just for a moment as you glance up, a hanging olive branch there in the leaves. It's almost like the leaf on the end of the branch grows just a little bit and then falls off and begins to drift to the ground. But that's where we're going to leave this scene and we're going to travel onward. So our tale now takes us beyond the walls of Balak, beyond the harbor of Balak, out into the Sea of Silt. In Athos, the oceans have long since dried up, replaced by a vast region of shifting silt. No one has ever fully explored its borders. It's myriad of islands and mudflats that dot its gray surface are some named and some never tread by civilized feet. The silt is so fine that people and most creatures cannot walk through it without sinking into its sandy wastes. It's a wild place, dared only by strange writhing monstrosities, giants who are tall enough to actually wade through its shallows, and certain kinds of ships known as skimmers. So as the crimson sun begins to wane in the evening sky. A small boat crafted from shell carapace large enough for a single sailor to sit on comfortably speeds along the surface of the silt sea, driven by wild westward winds. The lone sailor of this tiny ship is a turtle named Cronkwall. Cord, welcome to Dark Sun. 
tell us a little bit about yourself or about your character. And I want to know what Cronkwall looks like right now, what his ship actually looks like right now as we meet him for the first time. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, I'm I'm Cord. Uh, I'm playing Cronkwall. Uh, I'm super excited. Thank you uh, for having me. Um, so Cronkwall is... Uh, he looks as if he has... Um, Minimal clothes. Uh, he's wearing uh, hides. Um, several beasts uh, wrap around his waist. Uh, he has uh, maybe these like wooden uh, anklets um, that were probably given to him. Uh, he has a staff um, with a, a woven dream catcher at the end of it. Uh, he has a slate colored uh, shell a dust and sand color uh, scale skin. And um, adorning that scaly hide is uh, the licking black flames of a tattoo um, that are in all of his joints, his, uh, his shoulders, his, uh, the creases of his neck, uh, his elbows, uh, and the back of his knees. Um, and some are licking from inside of his, uh, from the inside of his shell. Um, he looks, exhausted. Uh, it has been who knows how long, days, weeks, maybe even months of him on this this skiff. Uh, this skiff does look like an old shell, or at least an old part of a shell. Um, it may even not even, it may not even be a tortoise or a turtle in make. Uh, it could be uh, from a beast we haven't seen yet. Um, but uh, uh, turtles are very um, uh, what's the uh, resourceful. And uh, he has done what he needed to do to move and to transport himself to where he is now. Um, he's exhausted and the wind is guiding his uh, path. And I think we see him maybe on the bow of the ship with the staff over his shoulders and he's just kind of breathing in the wind as he relaxes and takes a moment in this in the sun um, as he kind of bathes in this hot moment as I think a reptile would. And as you breathe in that air, you feel silt pelt your face, which is normal when you're sailing. Uh, the heat of the sun overhead, it's later in the day, um, but it's still hot. Mm -hmm. You smell something like fire in the distance, which is strange. You must have traveled a long way, but it's that unmistakable burnt smoky smell. I think he opens his eyes for a moment and uh, that kind of interrupts his sunbathe as he he looks behind him uh, worried. And uh, I think he catches his breath and starts to try and relax again. You glance behind you and it's hard to see too far into the distance because of the way that the storms and the wind kick up the silt into the air. You're constantly sailing through what's like a fog of sand. Um, you don't see anything behind you, that faint fiery smell is gone. It's there, when you turn around, it's gone. When you turn back, it's gone. Roll me an athletics check. Nine. Crunkwall, you feel suddenly the base of your boat rock to the right as though it had struck a rock. Yeah. It nearly tips over with a sudden force, threatening to sped, uh, spin you around and send you sprawling overboard into the sea. You don't fall into the sea, you catch yourself, but it does knock you down almost flat to the ground. 
So he, uh, I think he tries to roll back up to his uh, upright and uh, look around to see what he'd hit. Does he, I, w- I want to know, does he roll around on the back of his shell to get back up to his yeah, feet? Yeah, like, what's yeah. his? He's, he's amazing. <sighs> and he, like, rolls himself up and uses, probably catches himself on the side of the shell and then makes his way up to his feet. It's and, the and, worst position that a turtle could be in. It's on his back. <laughs> so he's, uh, yeah, you do push yourself back up and sort of steady yourself, and you can see just wildly that sail whipping in the wind. As you steady yourself, a spray of sand kicks up some 15 feet into the air ahead of you. Um, it's like a geyser of silt straight up into the air, and then it's gone. Uh, I think I'm going to try uh, Kronkwall starts to uh, waddle towards the uh, the sail I guess which is made of probably a shambling of canvas and or hides uh, and he tries to I guess there's a word for it but <laughs> he's going to try to steer it uh, and I think uh, guide the wind or uh, try to take the wind in a different direction um, if he's going towards danger he's going to try to steer yeah. away from that and and Cronquall is um, a skilled sailor, right? I mean, he's he's gone out on these little ships a number of times. Um, so let's see. Let's call it a let's call it a survival check. Are, are you proficient in survival? Yes, I thought so. Yeah, let's call it a survival check. I'd say this is just based on his experience. you start to change or attempt to uh, guide and change the direction of the ship, but the wind is more forceful now, pushing harder, and it actually, you feel caught in it. Your tiny ship, just this small speck, the great big sea being pushed Mm -hmm. further and further forward, and then you see another burst up into the air, 15 feet like a geyser of sand Uh. right in front of you, and a moment later, a creature flies out of the sand, propelled by a means that's not obvious. There's no wings. The thing is worm-like, with yellow and pink scales, the length of your arm, but maybe the girth of a small tree trunk. Its tail ends in a blue spiked barb, and its hideous mouth fills its eyeless face with three rows of sharp razor teeth that snap wildly into the air. Just for a moment, the creature's up there, hovering in the air, suspended, actually matching pace. Even as you're pushed forward, it's moving forward at exactly the same speed. Mm. It's a worm with a blue tail and just, just kind of... Yeah, I have... Uh, a... You know what? I, there. There you go. Did you send me a thing? Oh, I thought I popped it up. Maybe it didn't, it didn't work. That's okay. Yeah, so imagine like a like a length of your arm, but thicker, heavy scales, worm-like in shape or serpent-like in shape, no eyes, big maw with three rows of teeth that go back further into its mouth, and a blue spiky point on the end of its tail on the other side of its body. My gosh, what is this? What are you? Hello, creature of the silt. The creature doesn't float in front of you for long before it suddenly dives down towards you, snatching with its teeth. And in our campaign, uh, we use a, a homebrew rule called active initiative. So. That means that I get to decide as the DM who acts first in a combat encounter based on the situation. When it's your turn, uh, if you have any allies with you, you can kind of pass it off to whomever you want. And when somebody's turn ends, they pass it off to whomever they think should go next. And I might interject, but almost never will I interject. 
So Crockwall, I'm, I'm going to give you the initiative here because it's floating for a moment. You have, you are aware of this attack in common, right. um, but you see it fly. Like it's just floating in the air, suspended in the air alongside your ship. And then it dives down at you. Okay. Uh, I think as this happens, um, uh, Cronqual is very curious in nature and starts to stare and ask what it is. And then when it starts to dive at him, um, I think, I think Cronqual's eyes widen. We see uh, these big black pits of eyes um, as they as he widen. Maybe the glint of the dark sun. Ah, I said it uh, in the uh, in the reflection of his eyes as he um, as he then starts to adjust and take out his, or I guess adjust the, um, uh, and take out the quarterstaff for a two-hand swing and try to bat this thing away from the ship. Absolutely. So go ahead and take your shot then. I'll say, like, it's coming straight at you, so you have, you have a shot. And uh, so a 10 is uh, going to be a miss. So you swing, you're trying to catch it right as it comes in, but you whiff, it almost, it's almost like it's coming straight at you and then pulls back and then goes forward again. Um, not flying with wings, but propelling itself through some unseen methodology. Anything else you'd like to do? Uh... Action surge. Okay. Uh, and then I will use. I will. Uh, it's about the size of my arm. It's about the length of your arm, yeah. He's going to. He's going to use. Um, he's going to close his eyes for a second. And uh, as he does. I'm going to focus on stillness. Uh, I think he may he may focus on uh, the the silt that is blowing by, settling uh, the ripples that would be if they were water, but maybe are now just craters in the silt. Um, he focuses on the wind stopping, the sail flapping behind him and going mute as he tries to use telekinetic hand and tap into the way to try to hold this thing from lunging at him. Perfect. Uh, throw that up for me, and this is a saving throw, correct? Uh, mage hand cantrip. Um, okay. So... Let's go ahead and make me, um, let's call it an Arcana check. Okay. And we'll use our bonus action rules. This is like an ability stunt, right? So yeah. this, this can provide advantage for something you want to do, or it could possibly provide disadvantage for an opponent. Okay. Uh, I have uh, an 18. Okay, great. Uh, so you actually like, as you sharpen your mind, you can see uh, that flapping sail behind you still. You can see the silt hanging in the air, just kind of drift down. Uh, everything seems calm and focused. And as you reach out with your mind to this alien thing, you don't get a sense of what it is or, or if it's intelligent, but you do slow it down just a little bit. It's still going to attack, but I'll give it disadvantage. So that would have been a 21, but instead it's a five. Uh, so it, it, it slows down and it's snapping its three rows of teeth wildly, just kind of twisting its head, worming its head closer and closer towards you, but it's moving slower through the air. And you get the sense since you used telekinetics that it's using telekinetics too. That's how it's moving. And so there's a little bit of a battle of wills right here. Um, that's going to be its turn. So I'm going to give it back to you. Roll me a perception check and then continue your turn. 
Natural 20 plus two. Um, you're aware of it without even seeing it. You hear the telltale signs of two bursts of geysers of uh, sand spilling up into the air from behind your ship. Very similar to the other. Okay. If you glance back over your shoulder, but you don't even have to. You're so in touch with the moment, so honed in and focused on the will uh, that you know that there's two more of these creatures behind you. It's your turn. Perfect. Um, uh, so there's now three. I will strike again with the uh, quarterstaff. Um, sure, and it's hanging right in front of you now, so you got a great shot. Uh -huh. If I if I would roll well, twelve. A twelve actually is a hit. Sweet. So uh, I, I think uh, as he kind of hones it, or like he he is in touch with the moment. Uh, he may, like, I think he may rest his long neck and chin on the staff as he's, like, there's this, there's chaos happening, and then that's, that's how he can, like, focus for a moment. And then he opens his eyes, and he sees that it's still, and then he just takes another swing at it, uh, dealing, Excellent. uh, D6 plus 2 is D8, and I've hit it, which means... As a bonus action, I can snap my jaws at it uh, for another d4 plus my strength. So a uh, hold on, I lost all of my count. Oh, that's okay. Uh, so make me uh, go ahead and make me the bonus action attack if you want. Total twelve. Uh, and the bonus attack is. Do I hit or do I make another attack? I make another attack. So it's a 13 to hit with the uh, with the snap. That'll be hit. Uh, so it's a total of 12 damage. Okay. Uh, so you four crack piercing. Four, four of its piercing. So you crack this creature in the side of its face and it spins away. You can see like some of its teeth knocked out. It spins back and begins to dive again, but you get to attack it first. So how do you quickly uh, finish off this creature? What's, yeah. what's a sand turtle's so as it's diving like. in, uh, as it's diving in, like I, I probably, the Kronkhal swung like a like a baseball bat, and as it's diving in, he just winds up as if he's trying to dodge it, and then as it's passing by, he just snaps at it, and then just cuts the thing in half uh, with with his powerful powerful turtle mandible. Yeah, uh, and, then, and that snap is so fast that it's like it's like scissors, like right yeah. through the middle of this thing. You can actually feel it's not; it doesn't taste good. Yeah, it's not like, pleasant. Yeah. It's not a pleasant mouthfeel. But you do take this thing right in half, uh, and it falls away. Um, all of a sudden, it's psionics, whatever was propelling it, gone. It hits the sand, and the sand, the silt, begins to quickly pile up on top of it and pull it down beneath the surface. Okay. That's my, uh, that's my turn. All right. Uh, right as you finish doing that, uh, I think you probably like turn just in time to see two of these other creatures fly towards you. They're both snapping at you as they come. Um, snapping before they ever get to you, they're just snapping and missiling towards you. Uh, we're gonna have a 14 and a 16. Right, armor class. Uh, no, uh, armor class of 17. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, you're total. Um, so I think one of them, like, actually hits your shell and, like, snaps a tooth and, like, bounces off of it. And they both go Jeez. back into the air and circle around and continue to hover, preparing to strike again. Let's say within your range, but just barely so. Okay. It's your turn. Um, I, I think, uh, he's going to try to, uh, confidently now try to, uh, swipe at these with, uh, with the quarterstaff again, uh, as they're just, they're just kind of circling now waiting for a, a time to strike. Yep. Yeah. He's going to, uh, I think he's going to, 
I think what we're going to see is uh, Quan Qual sizes up the situation, sees that they're up high, and he's going to try to climb the, the, the mast of his skiff. See if he can get a little bit higher. Um, you like shimmying up the try, shimmying yeah, up the mast. Yeah, he's very Absolutely. top heavy, so this is probably awful. Yeah. But um, do you want to roll for me and, for that? Yeah, give me an athletics check, and this is going to be another action stunt. So this is a bonus action to climb up there. All right, that's a two. Uh, so that's a six. <laughs> you get like I think Cronkwall like gets his body like three things up, and he's kind of swaying with how quickly the wind is blowing. And you you like digging digging into it. And then it's that awkward, like, slow slide back down. That was a bad idea. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, is there any more actions, or is that it? No, that's a bonus action. So, I mean, like, if you have a, a ranged attack, or if you want to ready an attack for when one gets into your range. I will ready an that. attack, yeah. I will, uh, I will stand uh, in a defensive stance, ready for an attack. All right. Uh, and he's going and to focus. And uh, he's going to channel the way as well and try to s keep a still mind. Um, so as I love, I love psionics. Um, and so I, I want to, I always want to play around with it when we do it too. Is there like an image that is his like, you know, focal point right now that just hits him? Like it takes him to the right spot. How does he get to where he needs to be in his mind? Uh, right now he thinks about, uh, he starts to reminisce of, uh, the bow of the ship, the edges of the uh, the keratin um, of the of the ship that he sails, the uh, knife the knife like shore that he had to push away from uh, when he when he kicked off into the silt sea, um, and maybe the rough edges of his his own shell as he starts to focus on those things uh, as he closes his eyes and waits. And as you're waiting and you're focusing for a moment, you can smell fire and smoke again, just for a moment. You can actually feel the heat against your skin. You can hear the crackling of a roaring fire, not a, not a tiny fire, but something massive just on the edges of your senses and then those creatures fly at you and you snap your focus just in time to attack one of them you can take that swing i will take that swing with a 12. 12 is enough to hit okay um so fueled by uh fueled by the stillness the um the hostile environment that he had traversed, as well as the um, uh, the the infiltrating aggressive smell of smoke, uh, his eyes open, and as they do, he thrusts forward with the edge of his or with the point of uh, his staff, uh, or another 10 uh and then he so i can only attack one of them or are they both mm -hmm. striking okay they're both attacking uh, you so unless you have like an extra attack or something like that you, see what this you used your bonus action already yeah yeah i don't think so not yet uh, you can make a bonus action okay um and then i have another thing because this is pretty sweet uh and that is yeah uh, I also Perfect. have augmented strikes as well so I can instead of if I don't have a bonus action I could then use uh, psionics uh, yeah. or use the way to deal another d4 psychic damage let's either I Excellent. do a bonus psychic or I could do a bonus uh, piercing so that's four okay uh, so 14 total and four of its psychic yes yeah, and so you catch this thing. I mean, it almost, like, it's flying straight towards you, and you snap your focus just in time. You bring up your staff at just the right angle. It actually goes straight through your staff and just pops like a balloon. The other one it hit, it bites at you from behind, though. That's going to be 
an 18. 18 hits. Okay. So three piercing damage and you are grappled. Um, yeah, so basically it latches on, like right as you finish off the second of the three creatures, the third one latches on. It actually gets right above your shell carapace yeah, the heaviest part of your armor and gets into the back of your neck and you can feel its tail wriggling behind it. Okay. Um, it's your turn. I will... I will try to disengage from the grapple. Um, and then I want to retreat to shell. Excellent. So, so, so uh, I, t- tell us what retreat for sh- uh, to shell means, because we're playing a turtle, a fifth edition turtle, right? We made some changes to make it um, a sand turtle for Dark Sun. So there's a few new things, a few slightly different things. So using my action, I could then pull my head and limbs into the shell for up to an hour. Uh, while retreating, I am prone. My speed is still five feet. My feet is my speed is now five feet, uh, and I'm resistant to non-magical, non-magical piercing, slashing, bludgeoning, uh, in once used i cannot use the feature again until i've completed a short or long rest so i'll try to like either pull it off or i'll just retreat into the shell and hope that does it yeah absolutely make me uh, let's call an athletics check okay uh 21 yeah, you squeeze into the shell uh, at just sure. the right angle that it at. You can feel it like pushing it off of your neck and you hear it flop as it hits the ground of the deck in your small ship, your little skiff outside. You pull back into the shell. Is that is that your turn? I wait. What? Yep, that's a full action. <laughs> Excellent. Roll me you one more athletic. From inside. <laughs> one more athletic. Yeah, one more athletics. You can hear it like banging as it tries to get in uh, several times. You can feel like tiny vibrations of teeth on the back of your shell. Um, You're rocking inside a little bit, but it's not getting in at the moment. Another athletics is going to be in 18. Uh, so you're sort of at a standoff with this little creature. Uh, it's not able to get into your ship, but all of a sudden, something else, uh, it's a force through the starboard of your ship, rips through the shell and the carapace, sending uh, your ship into splinters. And you feel your own body within your shell flipping through the air, spinning into the air. Uh, with a 18 athletics check, I will give you a chance to tell me how you deal with this unexpected situation. Well, uh, naturally he's a turtle, so he's just gonna stay in the shell. So I think whatever happens, happens, but there's also a shell there. All right. I, yeah, I, and we'll, like say, that's, yeah, we'll say even as like if you, po- if you poke your head out of the way, you don't see the creature, at least not for the moment, that was kind of banging against your shell before, but you do see like you, you your arms have basically managed to be uh, wrapped around um, like a little piece of, it, it, call it like a wedge of what was your ship has snuck into your shell. That could be a tool that you could use for something. Okay. Um, it's all you have as you fly through the air away from the shards of your ship for a moment you can see something fleshy and pink large rise up out of the silt and then sink back down into the silt uh, but you are flying flying down towards the surface possibly to sink we will find out after we go to break and come back <laughs> Greetings, adventurers. Today we're excited.
swipe at Soren, landing near his feet. As Rowena stri- Greetings, adventurers. Today we're excited to introduce you to a new story, Dark Dice, a horror podcast that blurs the line between actual play and audio drama, where the story is determined by the roll of the dice. Six adventurers embark on a journey into the ruinous domain of the Nameless God. They will never be the same again. One of the players is not what they seem after a doppelganger, a creature that can assume the form and voice of whatever it kills, infiltrates the team. As the players are picked off and replaced one at a time, can they figure out who the monster is before it's too late? Can you? In addition to a full-blown fantasy soundtrack with over 30 live medieval instruments and a 40-person choir, sound effects further enhance the story. Here's a quick example of what that sounds like. The, uh, shambler with the jar of liquid inside of him. Soren Arkwright let loose an arrow that cracked the glass, passing through the spine of the creature. The shambler still managed to maintain its forward momentum, but stumbled as it eagerly tried to bite and swipe at Soren, landing near his feet. As Rowena struck the shambling creature near Soren, she shattered the canister in its stomach, sending its liquid contents spilling to the ground. With a rush of liquid, the small fetus fell too, twitching and moving toward Rowena. I'm gonna punt you. Rowena launched the fetus into the mouth of the mimic with a kick. So if you dare, gamble your sanity and subscribe to Dark Dice however you listen to podcasts or on Spotify. Dark Dice can also be streamed at darkdicepod.com. Ever since I was a child, I had to grow up on the streets, wrestling alley bears for food and fighting guards for my own freedom. It was in those streets that I knew I couldn't trust anyone but myself. The only thing for sure was that I had to find the monsters who put me there to exact my revenge and finally put my restless hunger for blood at ease. So is that why you're standing in the corner of a tavern conspicuously? That's something deeply mysterious and intriguing for you to find out. But I doubt you'd understand all the pain and suffering I've had to endure to- All right then, I'll see you later. Wait, no, you were supposed to be deeply interested and ask me more about my backstory. You know what? I'm tired of being another cog in the machine of an adventuring party. I'm going off on my own, following my own creed, and doing what needs to be done. That's right, I'm going rogue. Do you get it? Rogues are the sneaky, savvy, skilly, willy utility monkeys of the Forgotten Realms, and the best pick if you're a backseat gamer since it lets you interrupt someone trying their best because they weren't doing it right. However, if you want to marry Sue it up even more than you already are, you also get expertise so that you can upgrade those proficiencies to anime protagonist levels of ridiculous. Now I know what you're thinking, this sounds a lot like Bard. And while that's partly true, the difference is rogues aren't automatically assumed to be the comic relief. Instead, they're deep, dark, and brooding, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, holidays excluded, because who could be grumpy on Christmas? The other main difference is their unique combat feature, the sneak attack. And because names in D&D are always inaccurate, you don't actually have to be low to the ground and covered in shit to deal the sneak attack bonus damage, but rather anytime the enemy is just not feeling up to it today and just wants to get it over with. This means if the enemy's being flanked or if they're laying prone on the ground or they just bragged about how high their IQ is, you know, things that would make them really easy to stab. You are incidentally not very easy to stab since you have a whopping four goddamn features dedicated to make you more difficult to pin down than figuring out if that teasing banter you had with your friend actually hurt their feelings or not. You can dodge when it's your turn, dodge when it's not your turn, dodge a giant ball of fire, and even dodge having to pay the bill on a first date. When a special a unique trait of the rogue is their exclusive language thieves can't. Thieves can't what? I don't have the slightest clue because it allows you to say a whole bunch of jargon that somehow translates into a completely different sentence. Timmy's having tea with the local blacksmith actually means let's go to the temple and steal some of the cleric's donations. Speaking of stealing, the thief archetype means you're especially fast at doing thiefy things like picking locks, chugging potions, and hardcore parkour. Assassin makes your stabs extra stabby and you can stab while disguising yourself as a child you saw who you can point to later and say they did it. Arcane trickster basically turns you into a bard except less talented or attractive and allows you to hocus pocus somebody's wallet from three miles away. Way. Mastermind is straight up Sherlock Holmes, complete with the assholery and catchy theme music. Swashbuckler won't stop bugging people to 1v1 them. And Scout, which is yet another better alternative to Ranger. Your job is to make sure everybody knows how much better you are at doing everything. Because when the going gets tough, you know the party's going to turn to you one day and ask you to please pick the lock on the door to the king's castle because the bard accidentally kicked the guard in the genitals trying to seduce them. And you'll gladly show them all the skills you've learned from growing up in such a harsh and unforgiving environment that was once your home, forcing you to learn questionable means and morally ambivalent beliefs in order to survive. Just try not to cut yourself on that edge while you're at it. And now you know how to play Rogue, you're welcome. Hi, I'm Sam from Black Cats Gaming. We're a tabletop role-playing game company based in England, and we're kickstarting our first game, The Spy Game, which is a modern 5e action espionage RPG. In the spy game, you get to peer behind the curtain of society into the world of the agencies 
and take your place as a world-class spy. Together with your crew of con artists, infiltrators and hackers, you can take on global threats or become one yourself. The Spy Game is being developed using the 5th edition Open Gaming Licence for a modern take on a familiar fantasy gaming experience. You can choose from a whole host of new classes like the Face, the Infiltrator, the Hacker or the Technician and you can use some incredible new gadgets, weapons and equipment. The Quick Start Guide is available now on drivethroughrpg.com. We've almost finished our alpha version of the game and we plan to release the beta version of the game to backers as soon as the Kickstarter is over, so that the whole community can get involved and influence the development of the final game. We're starting the production of this game from the ground up, so please lend us your support and follow the Black Cats into a world of international espionage and adventure. While anxious wives paced widow's walk, scanning the horizon, watching the sea, the warmth of the fireside guided their creaking ships past the ever-present lighthouses safely into port. Today as yesterday, these sentinels of safety bring gladness to the hearts of the homing mariner.
And we're back from our break. And it looks like we have a giveaway winner. It is Quintastic. So Quintastic, congratulations on that dice set. My friend, we will be in touch uh, and we'll work out the details with you, but congratulations, our first giveaway. But let's get back to the story at hand. It's been a long voyage across the Silt Sea for the Akasha, the flagship of the merchant fleet for the Elvish House Sereno. The deck is busy with Elvish sailors tying ropes, manning sails. Miles ahead against the dying light of the sun, the sailors look out and they can just see the blurry skyline of Balak, its ivory and gold buildings glinting like a jewel in the distance. At the fore of the ship is a dashing young rogue of an elf with flowing red hair dressed in leather armor studded with animal bones. At Captain Tanyan's side hangs a sheathed elvis uh, stone longsword, just sort of rattling in the wind. And he smiles broadly with a flash of white teeth. But meanwhile, down below, beneath the deck of the ship, we go to Akasha of House Sereno, the very woman that the flagship is named for. Welcome to Dark Sun, Christina. Hi. I hope that you can hear me well. I can. I can. Yay. Yeah. Uh, so tell us what Akasha looks like right now, and then what's she doing? Akasha is generally draped in velvet robes, as she is generally wealthy. Uh, so she is currently draped in green and purple robes. She has long braids. Her skin is slightly purple and she is an elf. So her ears are. And you will see her, she is hiding um, at the moment because she is in disguise as Laguerre, who is her alter ego that she uses to go out amongst the city and be among the people. And even as the boat is named for her, she is still in disguise at the moment. Uh, would you like me to tell you where I am? Yeah, yeah. Where where does she go to hide away and what's she doing right now? Akasha is sitting with two of her friends who are her dolls and she is comforting them because they don't really like to be on the ship because they're not very fond of sailing because dolls don't like to sail. So she is trying to comfort them by singing them a song. And she is a bard as well. They used to be sea, so good for wayfaring. But now we skin instead of sail, our future a mystery. Who am I? Where will I go? Oh, where will this journey lead? I'll find out soon when we get where we go on what used to be the sea. I'll find out soon when we get where we go on what used to be the sea. It's okay, you're okay, of course you're okay. <sighs> oh man, I love it. Uh, that's okay, so you, you finish your song, um, just caught up in the moment with uh, your friends. And because maybe you were so caught up, you didn't notice the arrival of Captain Tanyan, your friend. Um, who knows who you actually are, unlike most of the sailors on this ship. You can just, just for a moment, you can hear that rattle of his long sword as he comes down the stairs, pausing maybe to listen to the tail end of your song. And he finishes moving down the creaking wooden steps. You can see him kind of duck down beneath the ceiling and smile at you. Are you okay down here? Hi. Hi. Oh, we're fine. We're just fine. We're just fine. We're just 
you know, they're a little nervous and I, I just wanted to make them feel a little bit better, but everything seems to be okay. He slides down the banister of the stairs and stops and puts up an arm at the edge of that banister and smiles and he says, you know, you, they don't know who you are. As long as you keep your foot up, I, I'm sure you can hide upstairs, get the silt in your face, feel the wind. We're almost home. I took it off because I got hot. <laughs> yeah, it has been a hot day. Ak Akasha, you don't tell anybody. Well, I guess uh, I hope not. <laughs> if, your, if your grandfather knew uh, that I was letting you come out here on these little merchant sails with me, I, uh, I wouldn't have a ship anymore. You don't tell anybody, do you, when you go back to the city, any of your, uh, you know, um, your patrician friends? I only tell the dolls. Oh. Well, I'm, I'm sure they're not going to tell anybody. They have friends. Uh, yeah. Yeah, of course they do. I, I imagine they do. Um, do you want to be on the deck when we reach Balak, or...? I think it would be better for everyone involved if I stayed down here. Well, suit yourself. Uh, if you could help me sneak off, maybe as stealthily as possible. Of course, of course. I still know my ways. You'll be safe. Nobody will see you. Thank you. Absolutely. They said I'm thank glad you, you as well. <laughs> uh, they're welcome too. I'm sure it does them good to get out of the city every once in a while. Too much bad blood and lies there. Well, I, 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 he sort of like watches you as you're speaking to the dolls. Um, he doesn't look nervous or afraid. He just, he just seems unsure. And he says, well, I, I suppose I should be get, getting back on the deck of the ship. Uh, but I, and it's right at that moment, Akasha, that you hear the call of another sailor from above deck. Um, just a shout, a bellow that carries down through the wooden floorboards. A man overboard, something like a man. And immediately, uh, the captain turns and begins running up the, the stairs. He's not gone yet, though. What's that noise? I, I don't know. Uh, somebody fell over or something. I don't know. A friend? I hope not. He hangs there for a moment, um, looking at you thoughtfully, and then whoo, up the stairs, thump, 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 thump. You can hear the boards rise, and then he's gone. You can hear several shouts up above, but it's just you down here in your little space below deck. Everything is okay. Everything is okay. No, no, no. No, no, no. As you sort of think about uh, your journeys, this journey in particular, but the ones before, uh, how many times do you think Akasha has gone out to the Sea of Silt, has snuck away? Hmm. Probably three times a month. Yeah, so as much as she can. She likes the sea. S sea adjacent. <laughs> sea adjacent. <laughs> um, and what is it about the sea that she likes the most? She's alone. She can hear her thoughts and it's just a break from politics as usual. Is there anything about the sea that she doesn't like? The feeling of knowing that there's supposed to be water, but there isn't. There's just something vacant about it to be there and 
to know what's supposed to be, but to see what is and to not be able to make sense of it. Sad makes her body feel sad. And in her home, is there a pool or a body of water or something that um, probably only prevalent to uh, the wealthy? Um, everyone else has to buy their bottle of uh, water and it's expensive. They can only buy enough to drink. But does she have a bit of water that is a place that she goes to and makes her feel safe or like the world could be different? She hides within the city. She has a small hovel of her own in the elven village. And she goes there and there's a garden of sorts. But no one must know. No one can know. You hear more shouting up above deck. Um, you can't make out what the words are just barking, maybe Tanyan's voice shouting orders, somebody else answering back and forth, back and forth. I'd like to sneak up and see what's going on. If I can hide in the corners, in the shadows. Yeah, absolutely. Um, g give me a stealth check, you know, just in case. Well, that's nice. going to be 19. That is nice. And it, it just so happens that as, as you come up the stairs onto the deck of the ship that a cabin, a small rise on the skimmer, uh, casts a shadow that you can just step right into and lean up against. Um, it's just your silhouette visible and nobody would notice you. And what you see is um, a number of the elvish sailors pulling up, up from overboard. And a couple of moments later, you see a figure come up from the edge of the ship. It's Tanyan himself who's actually leaning down partly over the, the edge of the ship. He reaches and with a yank, he pulls up Cronkwall, the sand turtle, up over the railing and onto the edge of the ship. Kronk, while you have sand inside your shell, uh, no. it, it's everywhere. In every, your nose, you know, your ears, everywhere is sand, silt, just spilling off of you. Um, you were under the silt for only a short time, less than a minute, maybe, and you just happened to catch right before your body finally sunk down all the way. Uh, the coming of this great uh, sail ship. It's much larger than any ship you've ever seen, certainly than you've ever built or sailed yourself before, made of wood um, with these great, uh, both sets of what look like sort of skis and giant wheels that help it tread over the top of the silt without its weight pulling it down in. And you see that approach before you sink down and then there's quiet. You can't breathe. And then arms on you, thrusting through the silt, pulling you up, up over the deck of the ship. And when you land, you see the face of a long red haired, uh, roguish looking elf. And everyone else on the ship is also elven. All different, all different looks. They don't look like they're related necessarily, but they're all elvish and the red-haired, roguish-looking one steps back away from you and kind of cleans some silt off the side of his face and brushes it off of his arms. And he's just sort of looking at you strangely. You notice that a few of the elves, they haven't drawn their weapons, but their hands are on the hilts of their long swords um, because they're not sure what to make of you yet. No. Hello. Oh, you speak the common tongue, as do I. Uh, why? <clears throat> uh, I am Captain Tanyan. Uh, 
Valak. Who are you? Kronkor. Kron. Kronkor. 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 Yes. That is I. That is me. Forgive me. <laughs> Kronkor, I'm sorry. I've just, I, I, I have never seen one uh, in all my travels that looked like you. I am a total. A total? I've never oh, seen you. a total before. I I have not in my time, no. Oh, I've only heard of your species as well. Oh, uh, you've never seen an elf before? Well, I have, but very rare. I haven't seen oh. it in, well, days if not months. Kind of like turns towards the sea again, the direction he thought he came. The captain turns in the direction too. Roll me a perception check, Cornwall. Oh, I rolled a natural one. <laughs> you still got salt in your eyes. You can like see the little specks. Um, Tanyan turns too uh, and kind of looks off following your gaze and he says, I forgive me, but how did you get out here in the middle of the sea? I crafted a ship so I could. And uh, your ship now, where is it? It's a very good question. He kind of waddles again. Well, I, um, and he reaches into his shell and he brings out that fragment of that like, like piece. yeah, that like maroon shiny piece of keratin. I guess this is it. Oh. I see, and you can hear a murmur between the other sailors as though they're not sure um, what to do with you. Um, and for we're a second, sailing. we're returning from a merchant uh, voyage, just a routine trip, really. Uh, we're headed to Balak. Have you ever been to Balak before, Tortle? I have never been to Balak. I have not been far off the Silt Sea. What is oh, well. this ship here? And he kind of just like starts tapping it with his claw, his webbed claws. This is quite the craftsmanship you have here. Well, I didn't build it myself, but uh, thank you. It is uh, courtesy of House Sereno, uh, one of the great merchant houses of Balak. A merchant house. Uh, yes, yes, a a house of merchants, not a literal house, of course, although they do have literal houses too. Uh, it's more of a um, collection of like-minded individuals, sometimes related, sometimes not related, working together for the purposes of business and adventure, let's say. All right, I will, I will say that. It, All right. Now, I, I'm not going to change my course, of course, but uh, you're welcome to come with us to Valak, and um, perhaps we can help you get in touch with someone who was sailing wherever it is you were heading. Where, where were you is, heading? Where is Balak? What? <laughs> and he gestures, and you can see just, it's in the distance, it's hazy. And the light of the crimson sun above is starting to dip and it's starting to get a little darker, but you can still make out just the glinting gold of towers and ivory buildings rising up to create a skyline of a city. Um, and I'm not sure, has Cronkwall ever seen a city before? No, no, he has not. Um, so, so that, so what's that like for him, even in the distance? What's that? How do you think he reacts? Yeah. This is Balak. Here. Those jagged mountains here. I, yes, well, they're structures. People live in them on the hillside and in the mountains. It's, it's the gem Balak. of the south. This is all Balak here. As he kind of like starts to frame Balak in his hands. <laughs> Uh, there, there's just a, a little bit, it's a good natured laugh, but a little bit of a laugh. And he says, yeah, yes, yes, that's all Balak. And trust me, once we're close, it'll, 
look much, much larger than it does now. Fascinating. I have never seen so much life in such a small area. How do you keep it so civil? Well, uh, we have ancient laws and customs and leaders who uh, dictate the rules and uh, write the laws and enforce the laws. And it's not always um, as civil as uh, you might wish, but nowhere is perfect in the world. Balak is better off, wealthier and safer, I guess, than most places, maybe anywhere. And that's where I'll go. That's my destination. Alec, I wish to see its inner workings. Of course, of course. You know, there, uh, there's someone I think, there's someone I think you should meet. I, I think that right. they would find you fascinating and also probably be able to help you uh, once you get to Balak. They know the city far better than I do. I'm a sailor. I spend most of my time out here on the silk. All right. I well, would like I'll, to meet uh, them. Of course, well. of course. Yeah, uh, come with me and uh, please. And he, ta and there's still like the murmurs of sailors all around. Um, he right. kind of hushes them and is, it, it, everything is fine. Everything's fine. Just do your business, do your job. Uh, this man is our guest now. This uh, a turtle named Hello. Cronkwall. Hello. Hello. He tries to say in salutations to, to all of to like group. every single person yeah. you do get a few you get a few uh, and i want to say uh as as um he's leading you towards the stairs and you're t giving hellos you eventually get to this silhouette of a figure leaning up against the uh arise you know a small cabin on the deck of the ship hello he says to this figure Greetings. I am Gronqual. Gronqual is I. Are you a turtle? Yes. Yes, I am. And you start to see his eyes light up with, with joy at the recognition of what he is. Yes. I think I like you. We like you. We like you a lot. Okay. I like, I like this a lot as well. Will you stay? For as long as you'll have me, I think. So far, so far so good, I think. As he kind of reevaluates this ship and, and the culture so far, so far it's been not so bad. May I name you friend? Hey. Uh, all right. Yes, but you can call me Cronqual, for well, that's my name, and that is I. Turtle. Cronqual. Cronqual. I see it kind of just ex gets excited and starts to waddle towards wherever he's being led to next, unless it's here, and then he waddles in a circle. <laughs> And, and that's that's the case. <laughs> that's the case as you waddle around in a circle. And you see uh, Tanyan just kind of like leaning up against uh, the deck. And he gestures to um, Akasha and he says, "This is actually who I wanted you to meet, um, but Ooh. perhaps, perhaps a, a more lengthy discussion should take place at a later time. Maybe not here. Right. Very well. Thank you, Total." I like you. I like you. I like, I like you, you as Tor. well. I like you as well. Tor. All right. On call. Both of you, roll me perception checks. Six. Six. You don't see it happen until it's too late. Um, an elven woman, one of the sailors, she had actually walked right in between you without even paying you attention um, and kept walking past you just slowly, steadily. 
one foot after the other, to the edge of the ship, one foot after the other. But she doesn't stop walking. One step, one foot after the other. And it doesn't seem strange to you until you see out of the corner of your eyes during your conversation, her step off the ship, tip over, and fall down into the silt below, disappearing from your view. So I, so we see it. You see a shape, a figure, a woman uh, at the edge of the ship go off the edge of the ship. Oh. Portal. Yes. Did you say the same thing that we did? I saw something, but now I don't. Tanyan is. <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry, Tanyan. Tanyan's watching you, um, and he he's not seen it, so he's just kind of looking over his shoulder, not sure what you're talking about. And she asks you if you want to go jump in. In the silt. Yes. He already has. But we can join her. Is that allowed? As he starts to look and read the. Read the, uh, I guess, read the, read the crew. Yeah, and already there's uh, some cries of alarm. A few people have rushed to the edge of the deck and they're looking over. There's that cry of uh, woman overboard. Echoes again is called out and Tanyan moves to the edge of the ship too, looking beyond, down towards where the woman disappeared. And suddenly the entire deck of the Akasha rocks violently. A moment later, Silt sprays up onto the deck from the sea like a wave over the edge of the ship, heralding a long pink tentacle, the width of a tree trunk, that wraps around the deck and snatches another sailor right out of his shoes in front of you. The shoes remain, the sailors up in the air and then over the edge of the ship. And Tanyan cries out, Silt whore, man the cells, grab your bows, we're under attack. Oh, oh, all right. Where, 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 where do I go? Where should I go? What do we do? What is, what is? Come with me. Come with me. All right. We must escape. We cannot stay. We cannot stay. We all must escape. We must not stay. We must not stay. Very well. Lead the way, friend. Is there an escape route that's in place for Akasha? So here's the situation. Um, and we'll, we'll say that you're starting initiative here that the Silt Horror uh, had its turn already by snatching the man out of his shoes. So you have four sides of the ship and you have a handful of sailors. And on your turn, uh, you can give orders or you can remain under cover if you'd like. Um, there are a few smaller skiffs, sort of um, like escape rafts, but it's windy and it's tricky. It might not be safer off the ship than on the ship. And you can already uh, see as you're starting to take your turn that people are going, they're drawing elvish longbows, swords, they're running towards this side of the ship where the woman disappeared. Uh, but yes, you will say it starts with Akasha. An initiative and when your turn's over you can choose to give it to Cronquall or you can give it to the NPCs the other sailors I would like to make an attempt to grab the hand of my new turtle friend and we are going to run for one of the skiffs but I will pull my weapon just in case absolutely and Cronkwall, uh, are you are you going along willingly, or what are you doing? Yeah, willingly. Uh, he's very curious about the creature, though. I think he keeps trying to turn and see what it is as it's happening, but he does he does follow. Excuse me, excuse me, friend, friend. Uh, yes, yes. Have you ever heard the phrase "curiosity killed the turtle"? Is that what happened? It is exactly. You must come with me. We must escape. Right. Very well. Uh, where, where to? They said we must go left. 
in my pities. You duck around the left side of that cabin in the center, and you can see the little uh, the, the little ship um, just hanging. Right, you'll have to get it down from its ropes, and then you'll have to get it overboard. You have to either lower it down or to do something riskier. Um, it's a whole thing. It usually takes a small team of people, and right now everybody else is rushing towards the other side. How do you want to approach um, getting down in this smaller ship? I what would. We are taking. I'd like to pull my long blade and cut it loose. Do you get in the ship before you cut it loose, or do you cut it loose and then the plan is to jump down into it? I grab the turtle and I push him in first. <laughs> oh. Oh. He is probably rolling in the ship. <laughs> it's just like the last time. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. I need you to grab my friends. All right. As he's reaching and then like trying to roll himself around. And I throw the dolls to him. Oh. Don't let them hit the ground. Oh, I won't. He kind of clutches them in his giant webbed claws. And as I jump, I want to cut the rope. At the same time, absolutely. Uh, let's uh, give me, I want to, I want like an athletics check or an acrobatics check here. Both of us? Well, we go with acrobatics. I, I'd say for Makasha because she's I'm the on, one. I'm on, I'm on back. I don't know. Yeah, you're, you're already in there. <laughs> oh, that's a 19. Okay, so uh, it's not that it doesn't work, it's that you cut it and you jump, um, but you time it wrong, right? So it hits the silt uh, and the mast rocks. It all actually cracks a little bit, threatening to actually break the shorter sail that it requires to actually be able to move on its own, but it holds true. However, you time your jump and you jump just a breath too late. So instead of landing right in the ship before it falls, you're all the way down through the air and you smack onto the deck of the smaller ship. Uh, it is going to be just a little bit of falling damage here. So for falling damage, you fall about 20 feet. And you slam onto the deck of the ship, but you are there and the sail is up. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of work to man that sail and get actual momentum moving. Thankfully, the dip of silt here actually is downward, so it's a little easier, but that'll be your next turn. Uh, Cronquall, you haven't taken an action yet, so if there's something you want to do before we run around to the top of initiative again, you can. Uh, he's going to try to unprone himself. Um, yeah. It'll probably be an action. Um, so I'm going to just <laughs> I love it so take much. up the whole six seconds and try yeah. to stand and try to yeah. write himself up. Um, that's what I'll do. And you have you have the mask there to help you too. Will they be all right? You're very malleable. All right. Very well. I um... Go ahead. Yeah, I would say uh, right around that time, the other ship moving off a little bit faster than yours because you haven't started to pick up speed yet. Um, you can see around it now as it passes you to the port side of the ship is a massive creature as large as the entire Akasha. It rises up slowly, silt spilling off of it. And the horror is a mess of blood red flesh that throbs and pulses as it propels itself along the surface of the sand with bursts of air from what sort of looks like a jet behind it. This is a giant squid-like shape with four writhing tendrils that squirm as they reach up for the deck of the ship and four stalks at the end of its head attached to lidless eyes that stare up towards Captain Tanyan and the others who are fighting it. Its maw is a canyon of red teeth and inky blackness below. And as you sort of get get your footing cronk wall and, and you're starting to move, you watch it as it pulls that snatched sailor down with its tendril into its maw. And that maw shuts 
and when it opens, the sailor is gone, not to be seen again. Oh, is that malleable? As he points with his claw toward the one who just got swallowed. That is expendable. Oh, so the malleable and expendable. Some things happen and some... We I'm should sure. go. They don't we need our go. help. Should we protect them? <clears throat> um, how far away would I happen to be at this moment? From the larger ship or from the monster? From the monster, does it have any, I don't know, um, legs close by or anything? Maybe 30 feet within my reach? We could say that within 60 feet, so if you were able to sail the smaller ship a little closer, it's hind, like the, of its four tendrils, one of it's sort of flapping and just drifting about on the sand is again, imagine the squid-like figure, but instead of it moving through water, it propels itself with bursts of air that burst out behind it. Uh, so there's one tendril that's just sort of flapping behind it. It's other three are reaching up towards the ship. So that, that tendril would be closest. Okay, well, what I would like to do is move the skimmer close and once we reach 30 feet within I would like to grab my friend and whisper to them and say what's the opposite of put together Kraken and I'd like to cast Tasha's hideous laughter yeah okay yep oh i should have seen that coming okay <laughs> what's your what's your spell save dc i love this game <laughs> oh my gosh i think i can pull it up here too Let me yeah see you if should I can have find it. it uh 13 13 And, um, yeah, so it's a strange reaction from this creature. Um, it's like the air bursts that are sending it forward over the surface of the sand. They get a little more erratic for a second. Um, just like, and it's jerking back and forth. Uh, it, it's a, that's a, that is a success on Tasha's hideous laughter versus the monster. I don't get it. Most people tell me that. Oh, what is it doing? Laughing. Oh. And I, I think it's your turn now, too, Cronkwall. Are we going or should we stay and protect them? Can I take you somewhere nice? All right. Should we stay and protect them, or should we go somewhere nice? I think that that monster will be down for a minute because I put it down with my skills. Well, as long as it's laughing, then everyone should be all right. Let's go someplace nice. So, so, uh, Cronkwall, where do you, as you take the mast and it's your turn, where do you sail the ship? Are you sailing it, continuing to sail right closer to the Malik. monster? Yeah, he's just, right to now. Set to that, you that change, crazy foreign change course. Metropolis, yep. Um, um, perfect. Let me roll. And at the same time, you can see the elves running to the edge of the ship. Um, as it rocks back and forth, aiming down with their longbows and taking shots down at this creature, as it's it's not it's not frozen, but it's just like sputtering forward for the moment, affected by your spell. 
um, and arrow after arrow just kind of breaks against its uh, thick, thick crimson hide. The giggle poots. The giggle poots. It's your turn, Akasha. Um, you're not sure if your gambit has worked. You're not sure if these people are safe. Uh, I roll the dice, um, and I but we'll see what happens in a minute. They, you have the choice right now. You're starting to break away from the Akasha and away from this creature. It's only partially visible now behind you as you're moving directly towards Balak, which is miles ahead, but close at the same time. What do you do? How far away am I from the monster? Um, at this point, I would say you're 60, 60 feet away from its hindmost tentacle. And I, I don't know, um, is, has Akash ever seen a creature like this before? She's only been out to out three times, right? She's scared. Yeah. She's never seen anything like this but she doesn't trust herself around it. So she wants to remove herself from the situation, but she can't let Cronkwall know. Mm -hmm. So they continue their journey back towards Absolutely. Her Do you look back, Akasha? There is no back, only forward. Do you look back? Cronkwall. And you look over your shoulder, yes. over your shell, as your ship gets further and further away from the other larger ship. And just in the glint of the dying sunlight, you see that flowing red hair of Captain Tanyon, sword in hand, slashing downward, and one of those tentacles is wrapped around his waist and he looks over his shoulder as he's lifted out of the air. And for a moment, he sees you. He sees the ship, the smaller ship. He sees Akasha's hooded head. And then he's gone, ripped over the side and down into the silt. There's no back, only forward. There is no back, only forward. There is no back, only forward. A friend. There's no back, only forward. He's unfortunate, no okay. Very well. He starts to, and he tries to guide and read the winds and try to sail it uh, towards, towards Balak. Um, your friend was expendable. Accident. You say excellent? Accident, accident. Can't look back, must go forward. Accident, accident, accident. Bad things happen, sometimes you have to go. Bad things happen. Very well, bad things do happen. We must move forward. What's Balik? Must go, must go home, must go home. Have to go home. you continue to speed forward. Um, that creature, it breaks away from the ship. You can see several figures, none of them Tanyan, other sailors, wrapped in its tentacles. It pulls them into its mouth and speeds away, shooting in bursts of air out from behind it over the surface, skimming the surface. And then it dives and burrows a far distance from you, not coming towards you. You can just see it there with perfect clarity over this dip of the sea of silt. You move on, continuing your way towards Valak. You can hear a song rise up from the other ship, the larger ship in the distance, just kind of carrying on the wind. Uh, Kronkwall, I don't think you would know what the song is, but Akasha would know that it's the song of creation. It's an elvish song about being proud. 
and resilient. But she's nice. What is this song you're singing? Can't look back, only forward. Can't look back, only forward. I think um, Cronquall takes his hand off the mask for a second. And he uh, waddles over towards uh, his new friend. And he, you feel, if you let a giant webbed claw just pat you on the shoulder and hold your shoulder for a second. back over to the mask and he tries mm. to hum along with a song that he doesn't know to try to help comfort mm. Mm. and as the two of you hum and sing together and you can hear just a little bit of that song in the distance ever farther and farther away now uh, the sun sets in the wet in the west um, not quite gone its rays red, painting the entire sky like blood. You can make out above just the beginnings of the two moons of Athos, one red and one green. And they'll dominate the night sky soon. Maybe you'll reach Balak before nightfall, maybe not. But you continue your journey singing together, leaving behind the ship to mourn. And that's where we'll leave this scene and move back into the city of Valak. We return now to the procession, the funeral procession that's left from the Akasha house. It's not quite nighttime yet. It's evening, uh, sun's still in the sky, but it's beginning to dip. You can hear and smell the sounds of the city as soon as you get away from your estate, as it is the way, uh, though you live in the villa district, the burial place is closer to the bottom of the hillside, closer to the actual city. And so it's a long walk. Merilla, you at the back of the line, or the front of the line, just behind the four moles, next to Lord Lucius. How are you doing? Mm. We don't talk too terribly much, and I'm not expected to talk too terribly much, and I think that's probably the ideal circumstance, isn't it? Not talking. Or looking at people. You, where where do you look? Uh, I just try to hold tight on a spot on my cousin's paw, just in front of me. Uh, that there's at least one place to look that isn't wrong. Hmm? 
and you do, you focus ahead of you, you focus on that pall. Uh, and one of the malls that's carrying, one of the four workers who's carrying the body uh, looks just over his shoulder, sees your hand there and shifts his hand up just a little bit. So there's a little bit more room for you to, if you want, to look like you're actually taking part in the carry. I look up at, at Lord Lucius. Can I check in? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, roll me an insight check. Six. <laughs> His face is a mask, like it always is. It is stone cold. He doesn't even, you think, look at you, but he ha- always has a way of looking at you without looking at you. I will know whether I chose wrong once I've already chosen. Uh, I I am going to grab a little part of the handle of the paw and help a little, a little, a little. You do so, um, and you don't hear a reaction from Lucius behind you. Uh, He doesn't say anything directly. You continue the long walk. Uh, You reach the bottom of the hill, still before sunset, and the moles place the bed down on the ground. Uh, They do what they do, and they take the body up in their hands. They raise it above their head, but for a moment, just for a moment, as this is going on, the eyes, the closed, covered, coin-covered eyes, uh, in the coins of... Athos are made out of ceramic, most of them, as are the ones on his eyes, are just at your eye level. You're close to Artemis, this distant cousin of yours. This moment should feel like more. It would probably be much more appropriate if I did, but I barely knew him. Mostly I feel guilty for not feeling anything. He's carried into the place where the body is to be interred um, and family members don't follow from here. There's no prayer, no gods, no ritual beyond the body must be interred because he was noble. So the four workers disappear into this little catacomb crafted in the hillside. And there's more fake weeping, but less of it now. People are already beginning to disperse, to leave, having done their due diligence. You can see behind you Lord Lutius standing there at the top of this little mini hill that looks down over the catacomb, just standing frozen, not looking at you or at the catacomb, but looking beyond. Uh, You also see Kalamni, the high praetor of social welfare, the wrinkled old man in his nice robes, his face is so aged that it's hard to make out whether he's smiling or grimacing. Is he looking at me? Oh, yes. <laughs> and he's either smiling or grimacing at you. Great. Uh, well, I think I'm stuck with this either way, so I should probably go up uh, and bow, curtsy. Curtsy bow. It turns into a, a bow halfway through the curtsy. Um, <laughs> Oops. He just sort of bobs his head up and down. You can see his jowls shake a little bit with emotion. And uh, after you greet yourself, he says, I I would do the same, but uh, it hurts my back too much, Marilla. Forgive me. Oh, uh, of of your station, Praetor, I I would never have such outside expectations. Thank you uh, for 
coming. Well, I, it is the least that I could do, and, and my duty for sure, and uh, it's always sad when a bright young person is taken away from us before their time, but such is the world we live in. I, 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 I'm sorry that uh, you are thrust in this position. I can only imagine it must be uh, terrifying. It is what everybody in my family has been made for. It would be a shame to my great Lord Father to be anything less than excellent, and therefore I should say that it is not terrifying, but therefore very easy and comes quite naturally. Well, uh, I suppose I, I, I don't think that uh... Uh, any expectations put on you would be fair in this sort of situation, nor on uh, Lucius. To, to that matter, everything the man's lost. Uh, but he, he and I were friends once a long time ago, and uh, I hope that I still have my place at court for a long time. And. Uh, should you become the next head of your house, uh, perhaps I might convince you to invest more into the social welfare of Balak. I understand, my Lord Praetor. I look forward to seeing you in future political circumstances. And most assuredly, I am new to this city, but in order to be a part of it, one must care for its welfare, must one not? They must, until they don't have to anymore, and that's how it goes. I would never presume. <clears throat> I, I liked what you had to say. I liked what you had to say, and moreover, I, I liked that it made uh, Lucius a little mad. <laughs> I would never shame my lord father, but thank you. There's uh, just a twinkle, just a little twinkle in his eye, and he says, oh, well, uh, I'm sure we'll see each other again now. Are you going to that uh, awful uh, political rally, whatever it is, uh, the Grand Garden? Yes, it is. It is expected, yeah. so I shall be there. Will I have the pleasure of your company as well, Lord Prater? Oh, I hope not. It's expected of me too, but I don't give a damn, to be honest. I'm not going. Those events are awful, but I hope you have a fun time. May we all be of such esteem that we may do both what it is expected of us and on occasion, Lord Prater, not do such things. Uh, thank you. I have my constituents to keep happy, and uh, I think they like that uh, I'm not always acting like I'm supposed to. I have to keep getting elected for some reason, after all. And there's that twinkle in his eye again. Um, at this point, everyone has departed except for Lucius and uh, Praetor Columni. Lucius isn't looking at you, but maybe he's looking at you. He's just looking beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I shall certainly take note in my burgeoning political education that mischief is all to the good. After all, how could a praetor such as yourself ever steer me wrong in such matters? Well, I, I should hope not, but I'm not always right. Uh, still, still, it was nice to meet you and, uh, I don't know. Hopefully I'll see you soon. Uh, come visit me, come say hi. I could always use more good young energy in my life, especially uh, when the house is so esteemed as yours. Not too kind, I shall certainly do so. Thank you so very much. Uh, of course, uh, good night, good night. And he slowly turns away, leans on a cane that's made of maybe bone that's wrapped in leather is using it to sort of 
move away. It's now that you see Lord Lucius looking down at you. He's not making a move towards you. He's not saying anything, just watching you from the little top of the hill. No matter how tall he is, and no matter where we are, he always finds a place from which to loom. I'm going to go up and to him and assess the damage. Uh, he does look down at you once you're right up next to him. Um, there's no sign of anger or sadness or anything in his eyes. He just says, was your conversation illuminating? It was, Father. I have learned more about our Lord Praetor of social welfare, and hopefully we'll see him further. He seems amiable. Yes, he does seem amiable, doesn't he? Did you learn anything else today? This was, after all, uh, one of your first big events. Um, well, I learned that there are many people who will come calling on our house in times of mourning, whether they are sincere or not, which, if nothing else, demonstrates the power of our house and of our name. Mm. What other reasons might they come? Uh, to gloat. There's a flash of ire in his eyes and he leans down just a little, still tall, still straight backed, but just a little. And he dips his head, a single half nod. There are many who would benefit from House Akatsia falling. Many who do not believe that Caesar should rule Valak as he has all these years, but we are ancient and we are loyal, are we not? Absolutely. Their intentions toward Caesar and Torah House will be frustrated, always, Father. It never gets easier telling who is a friend and who is a foe that smiles. You practice it your entire life, Merula, and there is no greater skill you will ever possess than the skill to know the difference. How do you tell? I suppose I just have a good instinct for these things. I wouldn't know how else to explain it. If I may be so bold, then what did you learn today, my Lord Father? From your instinct? I learned that House Wavir and its new leadership are wolves. And I learned that a desperate old man who was about to be voted out of office would do anything, even crawl on his hands and knees, just to hold on to power a little longer. I understand. So, what is the next step for our house, then? We wake up in the morning and we do business as usual. You continue your studies and you get better at speaking in front of people. I know it uh, was not fair to make you do that, but there is no other choice. And people have expectations of House Akatsia. I won't disappoint them, or you. 
He nods his head and he looks up towards the crimson sun and starting to set in the distance. Well, I'm going to go back to the house now. Take your time, do what you need. Be back for supper. Yes, Father. Thank you. Hmm. He turns on his heels without a farewell other than a slight noise and an acknowledgement that he is leaving. And he begins to step away with even steady steps. Exactly in the same path that you traveled to come here. You are now in this sort of evening shadow of this catacomb alone. How alone? There's the blackbird right up there on top of the catacomb. Just nice. kind of, it's got like an olive that it's in between its beaks that it keeps squishing between its beaks. Mm. What did you learn today, Corey? You have to tell me. It's the law, Alec. And I'm a very important patrician. It tosses the olive up into the air and snatches it and it drops down the back of its throat. You don't say! The very scandal of it all! Chirps and squawks. Flaps its wings but doesn't take off. I scrounge up a little seed, a few seeds and hold them in my hand. Come here. Very, very slowly, it takes off, flap, 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 and then drops down and begins to uh, peck seeds out of your hand. You are incorrigible. You cannot be couraged. Thank you for being around today. The bird squawks one more time, and not like a bird, more like a dog or, or a larger domesticated pet, just kind of brushes its head up against your leg and then takes off into the air, circles around you, up above you, and then flies off to the north. Roll me an arcana check or, uh, no, let's make it insight. Ah. You don't recognize the voice, but there's a voice. It's not out loud, or maybe it's on the wind. Maybe it's in your head. It's like it's through a muffled chamber. But the voice speaks your name. Marilla, Marilla, help. They're after me. Hello? You hear, you hear that repeated. Marilla, Marilla, help. Help. They're after me. Hello? What? Do I see anyone? You turn around, um, looking, you see Lucius stepping now a little bit in the distance in the path, moving off. Um, you don't see anybody around you. Uh, this is the dumbest thing in the whole world, uh, but I look in the catacomb. There's still torches lit. They haven't died, but they will. Just casting eerie shadows over cobwebs and dark stone on the inside. It's a small space. It's not a large catacomb. It's just a tomb large enough for Artemis. You can see um, some sort of insect. You think maybe you've seen them at the market before, but you, the name of it just escapes you. 
crawling over the man's face. And then you hear that sound again echoing in the chamber. Marilla, Marilla, help. They're after me. Artemis? I've lost it. I've lost it. I've lost it. It's gone. I've lost it. Artemis? Is that you? There's a gust of wind outside. It actually slams the door to this little catacomb once and then it opens again. <laughs> what is going on? Uh, really? If someone is pranking me or if this, this really isn't funny. Roll me one more insight check. 13. You're sure the echo isn't in the room. You're sure it's in your mind. And for a moment, you get a face. It's like two minds connecting. It's psionics. And you see the face of the person speaking, but you can't see where they are. And it's a young urchin named a van with long blonde hair, a friend, somebody that you know. His eyes are wide and look scared. Uh, well, then I can at least get to that part of town. This is, yeah, you know, this day. Fine. Par for the course. I wonder if this is what happened to everybody else in my family. Um, I want to go to the part of town where I've seen Ben before, where we've interacted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, have you been to, you've been, have you been to a bell tower before? Can one climb them? You can. There's vines. Then yes. <laughs> and so that's where you run off towards. Uh, and every once in a while, you think you hear that voice. It's a little more dim. And then it's about halfway through your trip. It's gone. Uh, you don't hear that plea anymore. But you get the sense as you start into the city proper and you're moving through crowds of people who are going home or they're working and pulling carts with these large lizards. Um, or going to market that you're not going to make it home for supper if you keep going. But someone's in trouble. <laughs> and I think honestly, I'm at the nadir of approval anyway. It's basically rock bottom. So, uh, unless one has a hammer, one can't dig any farther. I'm going to miss supper and my father's going to be very cross. And I'm going to keep going. You double down. You yeah. You run through the streets. You have to, I mean, it's not a, it's nighttime almost uh, by the time that you get there. And uh, you see that bell tower old ivory crumble door broken down out front um you know the vine stretching along the outside walls and you see the two open windows at the very top just like it's been before you're not sure if van's there or not uh but this is the tower i'd like to go in Quietly? Inconspicuously? Absolutely. How does, how does it look when Marilla's being inconspicuous? They, with one leg, kick up uh, some of their rope, catch it with the other hand, draw it close to their body, and they get just a little bit lower and 
start moving a little more smoothly, a little more fluidly, where they are intensely awkward in public speaking, somehow they do a little bit better in public sneaking. Excellent. Roll me a, roll me a stealth check and, and you are climbing on the outside of the tower. Is that the idea or are you going inside? Uh, I would like to climb on the outside. I would like to Absolutely. climb on the outside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Roll me a, roll me a stealth check and then roll me uh, either an acrobatics or athletics mm -hmm. check your choice. <laughs> Let me know what those results are. I do. Ah, um, that's a 10 from the acrobatics, but a 25 from the stealth. So it's slow, um, but maybe careful, right? You're keeping to the shadows, you're moving around, you're making sure that nobody's watching. And when somebody is passing by, because this isn't a back alleyway, right? It rises up above the other buildings nearby, but there's not a lot of foot traffic here. But when there is foot traffic, you hold still. You wait and you climb. Before you get to the top, I want to return to the top of the tower at an undisclosed time. And to Rysar. Rysar, you're standing there uh, in front of Van, this urchin who's looked up at you. He sees you, looks into your eyes. He's pulled his head back. His backhand is still touching the green wall behind him, and you've asked him to come with you. And there's this tense moment for a second. And then Van says, how do I know I can trust you? You don't, but you have little option. Go to my house. Wait outside in the alleyway. Don't draw attention to yourself. I'll return later this evening. Change your clothes. Does he have like, uh, can I, is there something obvious I can take off him so it changes his appearance slightly, like rags or something? Or I mean, yeah, you could take, but you'd be stripping him down unless you give him some new clothes immediately. Have I got anything like the so the praetor? The Praetor robes, is it a one piece? Is there bits to it? Right, yeah, it's a, it's sort of a one piece, uh, faux one piece, and it's, you know, these white and purple robes. Do you have like a, do you have like a shawl or something on over top of it well, at the moment? I do, I do have a lot of things inside my robe. I have uh, lots of pockets of stuff, and I think definitely some sort of scarf, sort of like a shawl, heavy scarf. So yeah, okay, I'm going to get I sort of slowly say, take this, give me that. This will change your appearance. He squeezes out of his grimy tunic, um, pulls it over his head, you know, holds it in his hands, looking unsure. He says, I, I, don't, I don't know where your home is, where you live. I'll tell him the address. You see, sense a flash on his expression that says that he doesn't want to know uh, the address, but he does. And he nods his head after a moment. He offers you the grimy tunic um, and takes the shawl that you're giving him, so he is right, so he can kind of wrap himself in it. Um, he says, "So I'm just supposed to wait in the alleyway?" And yes, uh, I would like to speak to you very much. <laughs> What do you want to talk to me about that you can't this talk to me about something. here? There are people on the way. Uh, they will not wish to talk to you. They will wish to execute you. Go. Mm, he, now. Uh, he, he nods his head and, um, and then turns and darts towards one of the two windows and you see him spring off the side and you hear a thump a moment later as his feet kick against the stone of the outside of the tower. You see uh, this vine that stretches from the inside of the tower out to the outside kind of go taut for a moment, almost like a rope. Cool. I wish to head downstairs at speed. So I want to get back down to street level. 
Absolutely. Um, outside uh, so, so you're moving down the regular stairs, right? Are you closing? Mm -hmm. Like, are you are you doing anything in this room before you leave, or are you just leaving? I'm closing the. Um, can I see anything around me? Roll me a perception check. Oh, I thought it was a two on the dice, but it was a seven, so it's probably rubbish. But let's <laughs> check. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's probably going to be about ten, so yeah, I wouldn't worry too much. Ten, let's say. Let's double check that. Just yeah, I mean, there is a certain strangeness to this area. Um, the green, the flowers. This is very unusual. It takes a lot of work to even keep a normal, well-planted garden alive. So the fact that there's something growing on the inside of this tower is very strange. Beyond that, you see um, some knot work just kind of tossed in the corner. There's, uh, there's, you... there's nothing. I can't see any obvious, like, there's not a spell book or some sort of... No, so in, in Dark Sun, spell books take so many different kinds of forms. They can be stone tablets that people carve their spells on. They can be, uh, uh, for a lot of defilers, they'll actually tattoo uh, okay. the spells onto their body. So yeah. it's it's actually, that's a big part of um, why it's hard to find spell okay. books because they're not always obvious. Well, I don't want to spend too much time looking around. My, my priority is getting back down to street level. Mm-hmm. Um, closing the trap door after me. Mm -hmm. Obviously, checking, uh, making sure no one's around uh, the, the half giant, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. And if if there's uh, if I can find uh, another beggar on the street, a waif, uh, someone uh, similar similar to the the one who's just magicked away. Is there anyone like that? Yeah, sure. There is a um, a beggar, unconscious, just like a ceramic bowl. It's kind of cracked partially down the middle and his hands just sitting in the corner, like head bowed over. Every once in a while it bobs up and down. Okay, I go over to um, uh, them and uh, I throw a... Uh, couple of ceramic pieces into the bowl it i don't start uh, up a little bit i say i am a praetor in service of caesar i require your help i have more money if you come with me now and looks down at the bowl and jingles it a little bit and you can hear the scraping of ceramic on ceramic um he looks back up at you and squints I shake my and then, sort of ceramic purse. <laughs> he shakes his bowl up at you. I, I throw another two in and say, I need you to come with me now. He gives a sort of like, eh, eh. And he takes the ceramic pieces out. He sets the bowl down. He shoves them into a little fold, uh, like a hand-stitched pocket on the inside of his dirty tunic, uh, and stands up unsteady a little bit, scratches his neck, looks warily at you, like maybe he's afraid you're going to hurt him, but then he just nods, resigned. Good. I uh, lead the uh, beggar back to the uh, tower and open the door and say, thank you for your service. The Caesar thanks you. You will be mm -hmm. well rewarded for this kind of peeks into the tower um, and looks around, uh, not sure what to do. Okay. Does it come inside? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I close the, the door after him <clears throat> and say, I need you to come up these stairs. Can you climb? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can climb. Excellent. This way, please. Uh, kind of holds his hand up to, to his face. Um, there's just a ray, a, a long ray of light casting through a hole in the crumbled roof down below. 
Um, and he catches his face, his eyes, uh, and kind of blinds him for a moment. He continues to follow you up the stairs. Trust me, I'm a praetor in service of the king. Come upstairs. <clears throat> it's cold. All of the. You all should... of the sudden. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, no, no. What were you gonna say? No, please, you. I'd say all of a sudden, um, his hand drops to his side, his back straightens a little bit, and he begins to step. Step, step, up the stairs. It's cold up there. Uh, put this on. I give him the shawl. Without complaint, he throws it over top his current clothes. When we get to the top, I want to sort of help, like, open the trap door. He just steps right on up into the green there. Okay. I say, oh, what can you see? out of that window. This is very important. End of day. A sea of silt beyond. A ship, small ship, coming in. I say, there is no backward, only forward. And push him out the window. <laughs> And he goes tumbling out the window. Um, Marilla? <laughs> yes? I'll let you decide. Um, I think it's your choice. Do you see this body go out of the window? Or are you up in this back window watching it from behind? With your 25 in stealth. Mm. I would like to be to be behind and see the push. You see the entire exchange. The two figures come up the stairs, um, go to the edge, the question, the answer, and the push. I'm gonna try to down climb a little bit and away. <laughs> you begin to scurry down the vine, down the vine, down the vine. Not sure if that was Van or somebody else. It was kind of hard to see that moment. Didn't sound like Van, but but why would they be here otherwise? Why would a Praetor be here otherwise? And as you scurry down the vine, trying to make a way from the tower, that's where we end oh. our first session. Ah. <laughs> we have plenty to pick up <laughs> plenty plenty to pick up uh, but that is where we will end our episode one. Oh man awesome awesome that was so much fun i had wow. such a great time everyone's character is amazing um and <laughs> <laughs> I want to say thank you, everybody in chat, for being so supportive, so incredible, so uh, kind. I'm glad that you're enjoying everything so far. We're just getting started. We've got we've got a lot of stories to tell, and it's just going to get wilder and wilder from here. Um, we got to taste the world a little bit, get a little hint of Dark Sun. There's a lot more there. We're going to explore it piece by piece because a lot of people are Dark Sun fans, and a lot of people are new to the world. Um, that's it. I want to go ahead and just thank one more time anybody who wasn't here tonight watching on VOD, watching on YouTube. Thank you. Subscribe. Help share our content. Uh, we're trying to do something special here, and we want you to be a part of it. And we're glad that you are so far. But with that said, I'm just happy to see all the cast together. Let's go around, meet everybody. Um, We'll go in a circle and uh, you tell me something you liked, something you look forward to maybe next time or in the future, and tell me what's up in your life because I want to know more about all these awesome people. So uh, let's start. Uh, we'll, go, we'll go in the same order we ended in, going backwards in time. Uh, Sam, hello. Hi, I'm Sam DeLev. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Tchaikovsky, C-H-A-I-K-O-V-S-K-Y. Uh, I really enjoyed that cliffhanger, tower hanger. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know what it was architecturally, but I know what it was for my soul and it hurt so good. <laughs> uh, and 
quite honestly, I am looking forward to coming back. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to, I didn't, we talked about these characters so much, but until you actually play, you just don't know. And I fell in love with everybody's characters immediately. Really interesting interaction. They're so, so lovable and relatable and warm and fuzzy. Yeah, well, most of the time. <laughs> oh wait, who is up next? <laughs> uh, before before I give it to Toby here, I also want to say thank you to our mods, our moderators tonight, um, doing doing the very important work of keeping our chat safe from negative people, toxic people, and uh, people that frankly shouldn't be there. So thank you for protecting us and supporting us. Let's go ahead and go over to Toby. Toby, how are you doing tonight, man? Very good, thank you. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me again. Uh, thanks to everyone watching. Uh, my name again is Toby Osmond. I'm an actor and geek. Um, and I love Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, I love that somehow I was sort of, as soon as we got up that tower, I was like, this is kind of like the end of episode one, series one of Game of Thrones. <laughs> But I mean, I love so much of it. I love that, like, uh, Akasha was, I thought Akasha was going to be like this, like, oh, I've got my dolls. Yeah, I'm a goodie. She's like, oh, there's no way we can save those people. Let's just go. <laughs> like, Kronkel's like, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> it was fantastic. Don, you're a fantastic storyteller. I loved it all. I loved it all. And Merrilla, beautiful, beautiful funeral. It was lovely. So thank you. Thank you. I'm 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 really I'm really excited to see. Um, I didn't know. I was really hoping there'd be a chance for Rysar and Marilla to connect. Um, I didn't expect it. It would be this moment. This moment. But I love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, oh man. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and go on. Christina, how are you? Uh, emotionally drained, actually. Um, no. Yeah, hi. My name's Christina Ariel, and um, you're my dolls. But um, this is really, really fun. And bruh, I would, I didn't expect any of this that happened. And I was literally on a walk earlier and was like, I have no idea who she is. And then when I found out who she was, she, like, I just want to say to clarify, like, she's not a an evil person. There's just like you know survivors gotta do things and all. in dark you gotta, you yeah. gotta live so you can't live if you don't live you know what i'm saying so yeah uh you killed me toby with the never back always forward i was not expecting that and it caught me very like and cord and sam you guys are amazing don you fucking murdered it uh that was awesome i'm having so much fun i'm like i was like oh that we're done. <laughs> I'm gonna keep going. It's so good. You guys are like talking about the characters versus like playing the characters. Like seeing you guys in action is just like like I hate Rizar as much as I thought I would, and I love that. I, it's like a, such a garbage boy, right? But yeah, no, this is great. <laughs> I love I loved that you introduced song too um, because first off your voice beautiful beautiful and um, you know that was something that you know you came up with right at the last minute and it worked so well and I didn't know either you know I I, I think Akasha is one of the characters that I was like I I want to see like I want to see when there's a situation where a hard choice has to be made you know what would be the priorities and I don't think you were like I don't think she was selfish but there's reason to be afraid uh, when there's a ship-sized squid monster coming up out of the sand people are jumping overboard other people are getting you know that's a lot um and to be fair I, that was Laguerre that's true and I want to I want to see exactly what because I I, I want to see what that means too I want to see what that means too but yeah, I had such a fun time. I uh, love that scene. Love the connection with um, Akasha and Cor uh, Akasha and Cronkwall, uh, and and this sort of give and take. And I love the I love the I don't know if we're doing the right thing sort of thing at Cronkwall because you know Cronkwall doesn't know these people. He's never seen an elf, but uh, he has his own sense of values. And I think uh, that I, let's go over to, to Myth. Myth, how was that for you, my friend? 
Oh man, I am speechless. Uh, this is this was so great. Um, thank you everybody for playing with me um, and having me along. It was it was it was fantastic. Hi, I'm Mythomatic or Cord. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Twitch of the same name. Uh, I do a lot of roleplay stuff. I voice act as well. Um, I can't wait to play this again next week. Uh, thank you. Uh, my favorite part, I think, was well, there's so many. Um, but the one that really stuck out was that callback at the end. The we uh, there is no there is no back. There's only forward. It was so well. It was just oh, that's when like like you didn't see me, but I was like, <laughs> it was just it was such a great moment, um, and I was just super excited to see it in episode one. So it was just really cool, um, and it's just I am honored to be uh, to be sharing the screen with all of you. So thank you for having me here and uh, and letting me tell stories with you. So. Yeah, that was that. It was just it was great. I I have I have so many great things to say, and I just don't know where to start. So, thank you. It's it's great to get to play with you again too, and thank everybody once more for just being amazing storytellers and just going with it. You know, not knowing what it's going to be and just going with it. I uh, I had a lot of fun tonight. A lot of fun. Um, go ahead and get on out of here pretty soon. But I am Donathan Fry. You can follow me on Twitter. I write RPGs for Modiphius and Peterson Games and DMs Guild and some other great companies. Um, and I stream uh, and, and play other games too. I think this Friday night at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I am launching another show over on Encounter Roleplay. It is a horror show. It's like a cross between uh, Stephen King's It and Haunting of Hill House and a little bit of the kind of dark comedy of, um, of a series of unfortunate events with a lot of great friends of mine. And I'm really excited about that game because I love horror and, <laughs> and I love horror, horror. And uh, I'm looking forward to that too. But yeah, thank you everybody for being here tonight. I had such a great time. Can't wait for next week. Please, everybody in chat, tell your friends. We'll be here next week and we hope to see some of them too. Share it on the um, socials. Yeah, yeah. Share us on Twitter. Uh, we're on Friends. Instagram. We'll be on YouTube soon. And we have the great support of Level Up Dice and Wormwood, our sponsors uh, who make this possible. And we hope to just get more Dark Sun out to people who've never seen it before and to people who have missed it like myself. So thank you all for being here. And we'll see you next week. Good night. <laughs>